morning, everybody, members, officers, and everyone watching the webcast. And apologies for slight delay in starting. We have a little technical hitch, um, but we have we're going to carry on regardless. My name's Councillor Pippa Halings, and I'd like to welcome you to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee, of which I'm the chair. And I can confirm that the meeting's for it because we've got at least three of the planning committee members here present. Following the end of temporary legislation, allowing public meetings to be held entirely by video conference, all voting members must now be in the same room. However, while there are two officers present on the top table, other officers and councillors will be joining us through the online um, provision. I want to make it clear to members of the public that a committee member proposing, seconding a motion or voting must be in the room. So all issues around decision making, proposing, seconding or voting on a motion, everybody must be in the room. Public speakers and others may be present in the chamber addressing the meeting by video conference or watching the webcast. And so please be patient as we learn to use the new technology. And this morning, we've lost the function where the camera zooms in on whoever is speaking. So I'm just going to remind all committee members and officers that we speak slowly and clearly um, so that you can, so anybody watching can hear us. When we vote on any item and there is not clear affirmation, members will not vote electronically in the moment unless we get that function back. What we will do is we'll go back to the old system of raising hands. So you will raise your hands for, against, or abstain, and Vice Chair, Councillor Henry Batchelor, will, um, actually no, it will be Chris Carter, who is Head of Strategic Planning, who will give me the final result, and we will then record that result. And in terms of speaking and asking to speak, again, we'll go back to raised hands in the rooms, members, and that's where my Vice Chair, Councillor Henry Batchelor, will let me know. And he will put you on the list, and please do trust him that you're in order. Some final housekeeping rules. We still need to follow the government's advice on indoor gatherings and social distancing due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So please, always wear a face covering when in this building and in the chamber, except as now when we're sitting at the tables and that will minimize risk to each of us and to others. Make use of the hand sanitizer on the table in front of you and at the sanitizing stations on the way in. And please observe the one-way system in place into and out of the chamber. So we're entering the chamber through the door there, and then we're exiting the chamber through the door um, on that side of the room. One exception to this, and that is in the event of fire alarm sounding. And in that case, you just go out via the nearest exit and use the stairs, please, um, and the fire doors. And as always, don't lose the lift during an evacuation. This meeting's been webcast live and a recording will be available after the meeting. By being present and contributing to the meeting, participants agree to their images and voices being broadcast and used for training purposes. Attendees may also make their own audio and video recordings so long as they don't interfere with the meeting. Please turn off mobile phones and other alarms set to silent. The toilets are available next to the lift opposite the chamber. And please, when you re-enter the chamber, use the hand sanitizer dispensers. If at any time during the meeting, anyone feels ill or unwell in the chamber, please let a counselor or another officer know and we'll do all we can to help you. Now, this isn't a well-ventilated room, and because of the absence of windows, so both doors will always remain open. This will assure some airflow, and it will remove the need to touch door handles. I intend to take a 15-minute break at about 11.30 to allow you to get some fresh air, and I also intend to break for 30 minutes at about 1.15, and we'll double-check with all of us where we are on the agenda at that time. Because I do think, hopefully, with today's agenda, that we should be able to finish before lunch. So in addition, I know I've just checked now. Everybody has checked into their NHS COVID app, those that do have it on their phone. And 
please ensure, obviously, that we do get back to functionality, that any papers on your desk or on your phone um, don't show any personal information because that could be picked up by the camera. Ditto any conversations as you are um, exiting the chamber rooms. Thank you, everybody, and welcome. As I said, I am Councillor Pippa Halings, member for Histon and Beaton and Orchard Park, and I am chairing this meeting. And present, I have with me my vice chair, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Councillor Henry Batchelor, one of the members for Linton and the vice chair of this committee. And also in the room, I have Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn. Councillor Martin Kahn, a member for Hipton and Eaton. Thank you. And Councillor Peter Fain. Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Uh, Jeff Harvey, member for Broadshed Road. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Tumi Hawkins. Good morning. Tumi Hawkins, member for Coolicott Ward. Thank you. And Councillor Judith Griffith. Good morning. I'm Judith Griffith, member for Milton and Waterditch Ward. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Chairman. Um, good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts, District Councillor for Foxton Ward. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams. Good morning, Heather Williams, and I represent the Morden Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Richard Williams, I'm the member for the Whittlesford Ward. And Councillor Brian Milnes. Uh, good morning. Uh, Brian Milnes from the Salisbury Ward. Thank you. As I understand that you're standing in a substitute for Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you. Good. And on that point, um, I think to the head table we have with us Chris Carter, who is Director of Strategic Development. I, I think you may have overstated my position slightly there, Chair, but uh, Chris Carter, Delivery Manager for Strategic Sites. Morning, everyone. <laughs> You're my boss, I think. <laughs> Pretty senior for me. And we also have um, our senior planning uh, lawyer. Uh, morning, Chair. Morning, members. Thank you very much. And we also have Ian Senior from Democratic Services, who is attending virtually. Good morning. Morning, Good morning. and very Senior important person Ian. who takes the minutes as well. Um, and Ian, do we have any apologies? Just one apology that you, you just found out about Councillor Milnes instead of Councillor Wilson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we now go to agenda item three, which is declarations of interest. Members, any declarations of interest? Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Just on the enforcement report, uh, one of the applications that's in there is one where I'm a local member of that ward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the applications is one where I'm a local member, and my wife is on the Parish Council Planning Committee, but I'm a second member of the Resolution. Thank you, Dr. 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 Khan. As myself, Chair, I've got two to declare, one on item six, Linton. Um, I've uh, given one of the neighbours of, of the site um, advice and procedure, but that hasn't uh, precluded me from taking part today, and I'll be coming to the matter afresh. And item nine, I'm a member of Cambridgeshire County Council, and they are the applicant, but again, that doesn't preclude me from taking part. Thank you. And next we have Councillor Richard Williams. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's item five. Um, I'm not actually a member for where this is, but it's about 100 yards outside of my ward, and I'm a member of Whittleford Parish Council, which is the rest of the three districts. I'm coming to the matter afresh. Thank you. Councillor Roberts, Chair. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, item five, Gutsford. Um, I was um, on the committee when we looked at it before, but I come to the matter afresh. I should imagine that's most of us. I, I think so. I think we will note that, that all those of, of the planning committee who are members and present at that meeting are coming to this meeting afresh. Thank you very much, Councillor Roberts. Thank you very much. And um, we go to now minutes of the previous meeting. Um, do we have any comments on the minutes of the previous meeting, members? Oh, thank you very much. For them. Thank you very much, Councillor. Chair, there, there are two. Thank you very much. So those those will be presented, and we do um, obviously accept that that's quite, that's quite natural, given that it was only two weeks ago that we had the last meeting. So we um, we fully understand that those aren't with us yet at the moment. Thank you, Ian. So that takes us to the substantive items on the agenda, members. So we are on agenda item five, which is Duckford page one um, of our agenda pack. 
This is application number S stroke 2896-19-FL in the parish of Duxford. And the proposal is for the construction of a 168 bedroom hotel with ancillary facilities, associated access, gates, car parking, including reconfigured conference center car parking, cycle parking, and landscaping. And this is at the Imperial War Room Museum in Royston Road, Duxford. The applicant is Puppeteer Hotels Duxford Limited, and the recommendation is for delegated approval subject to Section 106. And members, the key material considerations before us today, even though this has been before us, is again the principle of development, character and appearance of the area, heritage assets, trees and landscaping, biodiversity, highway safety, flood risk, neighbor amenity, and safety. <coughs> it's not um, a departure from policy. The presenting officer is Karen Pelcoggins, a senior planning officer, and it's being brought to the committee um, on the basis of the officer's assessment of the sensitivity and significance of the proposals and of the level of local interest that there is in this application. Um, and Karen, as the presenting case officer, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hello. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> nice. <laughs> thank you. Karen, yes, do you want to give us um, any updates and also summary of the, the process? And um, I'm not sure who... Just, sorry, Karen, if just hold on. Everybody who's there waiting in teams, seems like our streaming has crashed. Are we back? Hello? Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Just one moment, Karen. Thank you, everybody who's watching this, the live streaming. We're having a few glitches this morning. We broke off for a couple of seconds. We're now back. We're now back with a presenting officer, Karen Pelcoggins, Pel Pel who is going to give us any updates and a summary of the application. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Chair. So before we start, I do have a verbal update. So just bring your attention to the Planning, Lifting Buildings and Conservation Areas Act 1990 legislation in relation to heritage. Section 66 states that in considering whether to grant planning permission for development which affects the setting of a listed building or its setting, the local planning authority shall have special regard to the desirability of preserving the building or its setting or any features of special architectural or historic interest which it possesses. Section 72 states that with respect to any buildings or other lands in a conservation area, special attention shall be paid to the desirability of preserving or enhancing the character and appearance of that area. Um, three additional letters have been received from various parties which have been sent direct to members. One on behalf of the Red Line and Holiday Inn Express Hotels in Whittlesford. One from Imperial War Museum and Property, And one from a third party. In relation to those representations, officers would just like to bring the members' attention to the decision should be made in accordance with the development plan unless any material indi considerations indicate otherwise. The NPPF is a material consideration and there are two specific policies in the NPPF which relate to this proposal um, with regards to economic development and heritage. So paragraph 80 states that significant weight should be placed on the need to support economic growth and productivity taking into account both local business needs and wider opportunities for development. Paragraph 196 in relation to heritage states that where a development proposal will lead to less than substantial harm to the significance of a designated heritage asset, this harm should be weighed against the public benefits of the proposal, including where appropriate securing its optimum viable use. With regards to other matters, they have been covered in the main report but I do have some comments with regards to um, safety, security and the cladding. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the Imperial War Museum has advised that it has been audited by the Civil Asi Aviation Authority in May this year and it was the hotel site was considered to be outside the licensed airfield area and not material to the safety of the airfield. 
the CAA is a regulatory body which will only comment on an airfield build, building that will create a hazard. The hotel would be outside the airfield security fence and be separated by that fence along with mitigation measures for potential vehicles and CCTV cameras. It, IWN has qualified security experts in this field and they are, regularly undertake security reviews on the airfield. Um, they also work with Cambridge Counterterrorism and the general police. With regards to the cladding, it will be obviously in accordance with building regulations for fire and safety risk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. That, everything from you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, and we, if we have any further questions for you, we will um, come back to those as part of the debate as the debate develops. Unless you've got anything else you want to say to us. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I'll go on to my presentation okay, now. Thank, thank you. You. Oh, you just disappeared. <laughs> I thought, well, that's it. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Bear with me. Can you see the screen? Yes. Excellent. Bear with me a second. Um, right. So this is a proposal for an 168 bedroom hotel <clears throat> at the Duxbury Imperial War Museum site in Duxford. It's a site that's outside of any development framework and in the countryside. Duxford IWM is a special policy area under policy E7 of the local plan. The site is in the conservation area. Sorry, bear with me. Okay, site is in the conservation area, which is the pink line on this plan and also has a number of listed buildings, which is the pink shaded areas. So these three listed buildings here are grade two star listed World War One hangars. The American Air Museum has recently been grade two star listed. And this is the control tower, which is a grade two listed building. And these other buildings here are grade two listed. The proposed site is over here. This is the airspace building, which is the large hangar, which you can see when you go around the roundabout onto the M11. And down here you have partner hangars. The runway is down here. And this is the general airfield area. The building would be sited on the eastern part of the site, to the south of the A505 and to the west of the M11. It will be positioned between the existing airspace building and the partner hangars. It would be six stories in height, with slightly lower heights than the airspace building to the north. The accommodation would provide 168 bedrooms, a reception area, lounge area, restaurant, and external viewing area on the top floor with a gym at ground floor level. The hotel's been designed to take account of its airfield context. Materials would comprise metal cladding, aluminium panels, and glazing in pale colours. It would provide accommodation to support the existing tourist facility, conferences and events at the site, as well as other businesses in the area and tourists to Cambridge. I'll just go through the plans now. It works. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me a moment. Okay. So this is the key constraints. An aerial photograph of the site. So this is the airspace hangar. The site for the hotel will be here. And these are the grade two star listed buildings. And this existing aerial photograph of the site. the existing site plan 
with the hotel site over here. An existing photograph of the site. So the building on the right hand side is the airspace building and the green buildings behind are the partner hangars and the area of grass is where the hotel would be going. There is an existing small single storey um, building on the site um, for services. The proposed site plan. <clears throat> so the hotel will be an L shaped building. The access to the site will come around the back of the airspace building and you will enter in here with a car park to the left hand side and then the main entrance here is, is over here. There's parking along this side for the hotel and the conference centre and overflow parking along here. So the proposed site plan, there will be a separate entrance into the, well, sorry, shared entrance, and then there will be a separate entrance into the hotel, which will be along here, and that will have a key um, entrance feature. The landscape strategy, so new landscaping is proposed um, within the car parking area around the hotel. Members previously requested additional landscaping and that is suggested as a condition to any consent granted, which was the incorporation of a hedge along the boundary of the slip road with the M11. <clears throat> so this is just the proposed ground floor plan. So the entrance where we come in, there will be an entrance lobby and then lifts up to the main area. There is some rooms on this floor along with plant and there's a gym as well. So typical floor plan of the rooms, which is the first, second, third and fourth floor. And then an example of the top floor. So you have the main reception, coming up to the lifts, you'll have the main reception area, uh, land and restaurant live, uh, sort of area here. And then there will be an external deck here where there will be seating and you can look over the airfield. The proposed elevations of the building. So the elevation facing the airfield will be this elevation here. The elevation facing the M11 slip road will be this elevation here. Um, and then you've obviously got these side elevations as well. So, yeah, just to go further into some perspectives. So with the views from the airfield, um, with the this is the airspace building, the existing building and the partner hangars and the hotel. The elevations from the hotel entrance. So this is when you come, so you will come in around the back of the airspace building and into the car park. So the entrance will be in this corner here. Um, the east and west elevations. Apologies, I think I've missed one. Um, sorry, that was the M11 um, as well, the elevation from the north and the side elevations, which is facing towards the existing airspace building and partner hangars. So the materials for the proposal will be pale cladding, so dark grey cladding for the windows. There was concern previously regarding the use of white cladding again, we, that materials would be a condition of any consent and we've asked for it to be not quite so stark in terms of colours, so rather pale grey instead of white. So just to give an example of the views across the airfield, so you have on the left hand side, this is the American Air Museum, which is now grade two star listed, um, which is this is the existing view and the uh, picture underneath is the proposed view. So you can just see that red line is where the proposed hotel will be. Again, this is further. So this is in front of the airspace building. So this is airspace. The hotel will be here and this is the partner hangers. 
this is from the roundabout on the junction of the M11 with the A505. So you obviously come around the roundabout this way. So technically you wouldn't actually be looking this way because the roundabout comes that way. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's what you'll be able to see there. This is from the A505 from the Sawston direction coming up to the junction with Ducks, uh, the roundabout with Ducksford. So you can see, you would see the hotel over the top of the trees there. This is from the slip road on the M11 where airspace building is here. So you would see the hotel in that view there. Again, this is from Grange Road, which is a bridge over the M11. It's quite difficult to see, um, but you would see a bit of the hotel in that view, but it would be, will be at long distances. And this is the view from the Hunts Road, which leads to Duxford. So again, you would be able to see the hotel in the view of airspace at longer distances. So just going on to key considerations, I think Councillor Palings did mention them, but the principle of the development, it's a special policy area in the countryside, the character and appearance of the area, heritage assets, trees, landscaping and biodiversity, transport impact and highway safety, flood risk, neighbour amenity and safety and security. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, and as I said, if there are sort of more detailed explanations that we need from you, we'll bring those into the debate. But I do see, Councillor Batchelor, that Councillor Roberts would like to ask something just now. Sure. Y yes, I, I would like to while, uh, while we've got the, the ability of having the pictures up. Um, oh, at sorry. Page, <laughs> at page seven. Yeah. At page seven, um, it talks about uh, the Historic Buildings Office and making comments. And um, that officer has the same um, interest and concerns, I think, as I have. Uh, the proposed location, um, what other areas on the site have actually been assessed? Please. So, yeah, a large area of the site has been assessed. So in terms of Duxford, they have, they basically, they don't want to put it in the historic centre of the site because that needs to be retained for the tourist facility. That is one of the main, um, obviously, assets to the site. So they have looked at the more modern part of the site to consider the development. Um, this is the more commercial area of the site. So you have the existing um, airspace building, which is an exhibition space and conference center and the visitor center. Um, the other end of the site, permission has been granted for a new large object store for the Imperial War Museum to obviously store their large objects. Um, so that rules that part of the site out. And I think further along that side, there's more of an open countryside character than there is on this specific part of the site. Um, again, they have looked at the northern part of the site and there was a proposal in 2003 for conversion of existing buildings um, but yeah I think there was viability issues there in terms of and um, sort of potential harm to the actual listed buildings themselves um, so Karen, can, I, can, I, can I just just quickly go on to point of order please yes, yes I'm sorry through the chair, Councillor Robert. <coughs> Sorry, Chairman. And is that a supplementary question on this one? Uh, yes, it, it, it is, because it, it, I'm thinking about the area, I suppose it would be the southern end of the site, um, which... Can I raise my point no, of order, no, please? No, I? Because I, I asked very similar questions when this was first raised, yeah. and I was pointed out we had to consider the matters before us yes. rather than speculation over other areas that had previously been considered or mm -hmm. not. Back to the order, Chairman. Actually, we are considering if we ask that question because it's Excuse in me, the report. Can I, can I just say what we are at this moment and under my chairmanship? All we're asking is: Had I think the question that can be asked is: Have there been, you know, whether we're talking about others, but, but what we have in front of us, have other areas been considered? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much.
Councillor Holmes Batchel, do we have any other questions on this one? Thank you very much. I do note that I think when people say in point of order, it's just because they're a bit frustrated with somebody rather than using it as a point of order. Thank you very much. Good. So, oh, sorry. Can I have that one back? Thank you, Karen, very much for that presentation. What I would like, excuse me, thank you. What I would like to um, move on to is the section where we do have public speakers. Members, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that in our protocol for public speakers, what it says is that we can choose either to have a written representation or a verbal presentation in the actual meeting. Um, we've got very experienced, some of the public speakers are very experienced with our council and with other councils, and what they've done is both presented something in writing through email to all of the members, and they are also here to speak to us. Um, this has actually happened before with people who aren't so experienced as well, who've sent an email sort of to all planning committee members to sort of lobby them or to want to get their point across before they present themselves verbally as well. Therefore, what I'm going to suggest is that we have a planning review working group, that we tighten up our protocol around public speaking and make sure everybody has it very, very clearly what are the rules for it. Right now, I will allow everybody to do public speaking as they have registered for public speaking. I have also, just to let you know, allowed people to speak today who have registered after the time because we're all up in the air at the moment with all of the procedures and the ways of connecting technologically and whatever. So I'm being lenient, but we will come up um, through that planning working group of the review of our committee with tightened public speaking protocol, um, just to let you know if anybody challenges that for today. So I will allow those public speakers to speak today that have been registered prior to this meeting and that have been approved by myself. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to clarify something you just said about emails. Um, unfortunately, my council email hasn't been working since Monday morning. So if there's anything that's come through since then that I would need to know to determine the application of officers could make sure I get a copy of that before the vote. Thank yep, you, so Chairman. I think in terms of that, that is the risk when people send things through emails because they're not normally a written representation is actually printed and presented to us in the meeting. Anybody who sends an email, that means it could be drowned in people's inboxes, it doesn't get to them, you know, it, it is a risk. So all I'm saying is people have made an attempt, but it's not the written representation that is, that is before us. That was why I was explaining, is that okay, Councillor Williams? Thank you. Good, so we'll now move to the public speaking um, section, and we have Sophie Gregorius Keepers, I think, who's on with us virtually. Hello, good morning. Good morning, sir. We're just waiting Hello, to see if you come up on the screen. Hello. Would you like me to start? Just one moment. If you just, ah, oh, there you are. Lovely. Okay. So you do know the procedure. You have three minutes. Um, you can just introduce yourself first, and then the three minutes will start from then. Um, and I, I will ask um, Chris Carter, who's here with me, to help me with the timing of that. So he'll let me know when you've gone to two minutes. Um, and then you've got a third, final one minute to go. Is that okay? Okay, I probably won't introduce myself because I'm bang on three without my name and it's long enough. <laughs> okay. Good morning. I'm the owner of the Red Lion Hotel in Whittlesford. I should start by saying that I have no objection to a hotel within the grounds of the Imperial War Museum. My objection is with the disconnect between the size of the proposed hotel and the evidence in front of you. Paragraph 85 of the committee report references a viable hotel of 120 bedrooms. All of the supporting evidence in front of you is in relation to 120 bedrooms. Why is it then that you're being asked to approve a 168 bedroom hotel? There is no evidence to support this, especially when branded hotels are viable from 80 bedrooms. The apparent rationale for this hotel is first to provide accommodation for visitors and conference users of the museum. Yet ours and the applicant's own research shows that 96% of the rooms in this 168 bedroomed hotel will be occupied by customers unrelated to the museum. Yet the second rationale is to provide an income stream for the museum. 
but you have no evidence at all about what that level of income stream is and to what extent it helps secure the long-term future of the museum. Or you have a totally bland, unsubstantiated statements from the applicant. So let's call this hotel what it is. It is a very, very large, limited service branded hotel of which 96% of the stays will be completely unconnected to the museum. There is, there is to be an income stream to help the museum, but you have no idea what that is. This hotel will be run by a developer in a location where a hotel would not normally be permitted. The building is large and as your own historic advisor points out, will have an adverse impact on this internationally important heritage asset. Yet despite concerns over the size, despite clear evidence that the majority of visitors will be unconnected to the museum, despite no knowledge about the income stream, about how long the agreement will, with the developer will be in place, you have not tested whether a small hotel would meet the needs of the Imperial War Museum. A small hotel would better relate to the actual demand generated by the museum. A smaller hotel would have less impact on the heritage asset. And of course, a smaller hotel would have less impact and existing hospitality businesses struggling to recover from this pandemic. One way of resolving matters would be by imposing a condition or a section 106 obligation to limit the occupation of the new hotel to visitors or conference delegates visiting the museum only. If the applicant is genuinely confident that the demand from the museum is such that there is clear need for a 168 bedroom hotel, then they could not reasonably object to this sort of restriction. Similar restrictions have been imposed on other facilities in Cambridge. If the applicant protests at this reasonable request, then that speaks volumes and underscores the point that I've made. The permission for this 168 bed hotel is being sought to serve a much wider requirement than policy E7 allows. So permission should be refused. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, do we have any questions? No, thank you. That was so clear and perfectly timed. You must have put a lot into making sure that was well timed. Thank you very much. I think we are listening very carefully to what you've just said. Thank you very much. You. Um, now call the applicant, Mr. John Brown from the Imperial War Museum. Good morning. Just one moment, John, as we make sure we've got you on the screen. Good. Um, we have now, you've got you on the screen and we can hear you very clearly. And you know the procedure, you have three minutes. And if you want to just introduce yourself first and then you have your three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. I'm John Brown. I'm the Executive Director of Operations and Commerce for the Imperial War Museums. Your officers have produced a comprehensive report which supports this application. And since the de delegated approval last June, we've met all further requests for additional information. The master planning exercise over the last seven years, undertaken in consultation with your officers and Historic England, considered all buildings on site, concluding that the hotel was best delivered as a new building in our commercial Excuse zone so, next John, to the sorry. sorry, I hadn't noticed. Just one minute, I'm very sorry. Perhaps, love, you need to be able to hear everything that everybody says during the, the debate and the public speaking. John, we've halt that just one moment. Can you just <coughs> repeat that last sentence? I'm sorry. Thank you. The master planning exercise over the last seven years, undertaken in consultation with your officers in Historic England, considered all buildings on site and concluded the hotel was best delivered as a new building in our commercial zone next to the conference centre thereby maintaining the integrity of the historic core. Indeed, the scheme to convert the officer's mess in 2003 was dropped precisely because the necessary works would be too intrusive. Our studies submitted with the application show past market performance completely justifies the viability of the scheme. However, it is the case for creating future additional business, which is really compelling. The overnight accommodation, will enable us to develop new markets by expanding our extensive conferencing facilities to offer multi-day events, promote IWM as a multi-day tourist destination in its own right, and support the development of high-tech aviation businesses at Duxford, which will benefit hugely from on-site facilities. Our plans have been thoroughly scrutinised and consulted upon and are strongly supported 
not just by your planning and urban design officers, but also your economic development officer, by Visit East England and by Historic England. The economic benefits for the local area, as set out in the officer's report, are clear and compelling. The hotel's size reflects an efficient balance of operating costs and the need to future-proof the building. In addition, the hotel fully meets the council's sustainability requirements and will benefit from IWM's comprehensive strategy. We respect the concerns of neighbouring businesses, but we should keep in mind this facility will not be operational until mid-2023, when markets are growing again, the IWM master plan will be delivering change, and IWM will be advanced in hosting a growing number of high-tech businesses. Currently, the nearest hotel to Duxford is a member of the International Hotel Group, one of the largest hotel groups in the world, and operates in a different band of the market to our proposal. So we would hope to build unique visits to the area with them as the breadth of offer enhances visitor choice. The Duxford Hotel will be a Hampton by Hilton and is quite different from all existing local facilities. Hilton is very supportive of this scheme, the extensive and independent advice, diligence and underwriting that has been undertaken. To conclude, IWM Duxford is recognised as the largest aviation museum in Europe and the busiest general aviation airfield in the east of England, but it currently only has the facilities of a regional museum. To thrive and grow, it must expand its offer and its infrastructure. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, through you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I need to clarify in my own mind um, the uh, association here between the Imperial War Museum, because clearly you're talking on behalf of the uh, Imperial War Museum, but the ap applicant is not the Imperial War Museum. The applicant is Profiteer Hotels. Um, so you can, can you clarify me? You will not own this hotel, will you? Um, it's, it's not your application, really. It's the hotel um, chain's application. You're just acting as a voice for them today. And secondly, you will have, I'm sure, heard the, um, the uh, person who came on just before you, the local person, um, and the um, statements that she made about how, in fact, the majority uh, or very large percentage of the use will, will be nothing to do with the, um, uh, the actual so running and the uh, question, what goes on at the Imperial War Museum. So those two questions, please. So as I understand the questions, the first is what's your relationship to the applicant? And the second one is in terms of, so which business needs is this serving, if I understand the, those questions, yeah? Second one. Thank you, but I may answer the first question. The Sorry, John, just uh, one moment. The second question, it was a statement rather than a question, so I just wanted to clarify the question. I'd like to know whether uh, the gentleman agrees that um, the majority of the use of this hotel would not be in any way connected to the Imperial War Museum's running. Thank you. Thank you. Could you answer those two uh, questions? Um, thank you. Uh, we are the landlords of, of this hotel, and the Imperial War Museum is not a hotel operator. So we have joined with Profiteer to produce a hotel and they will build and operate the hotel on our behalf and we have a revenue sharing arrangement uh, to to gain benefit from the proceeds which will directly support the museum's output that's question one and in terms of question two um i i respect uh, and i don't disagree with the analysis that that the previous speaker suggested However, those are old figures based on 2015 and do not reflect the increase in business either on site or indeed in the local area or indeed uh, in terms of the local tourist expansion that is in not only the local plan but also in the East of England plan and the plan from the Department of Culture. And we are looking at future business and creating opportunity. So we must be able to act commercially, 
uh, and look at searching out and attracting that future market. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question. Uh, yes, we have three, Chair. One from myself, Councillor Heather Williams, and then Councillor Mills. So my question is around the Civil Aviation Authority. Um, clearly, we as a planning committee haven't had any official response to this planning application back from them, but I think in the officer's uh, presentation, she mentioned that the Civil Aviation Authority had actually audited the Imperial War Museum site earlier this year, and actually, I didn't, and she had some comments, or they had some comments around this particular site that's proposed for the hotel. I didn't know if you could expand on that for us, please. Yes, certainly. The, the CAA will only comment as a regulator on a hazard. So by default, if they haven't commented, it's not a hazard. But more so than that, it is completely outside the licensed airfield area. If you think about it, it's actually a smaller footprint than the airspace hangar next to it. Um, and therefore, actually, the airspace hangar is a larger obstacle than, than the hotel will be. But the CAA are quite satisfied this has no material implications for airfield operations and therefore will not comment on it. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Heather Williams had a question there. Thank you, Chairman. Through yourself, I'm just obviously um, a big point of argument in this is about sustainability and, and to you know, give income revenue streams to the Imperial War Museum, which we do have policy to support. However, I, I think I just heard about some sort of ratio agreement, and I think that is quite important. The, the what is the ratio? Because if it's five or ten percent, you could have a very different opinion than if we knew it was going to be fifty percent. Thank you, Chairman. And um, I will, after this, also ask officer's opinion in terms of sort of material considerations for us around that. But yes, could you answer the question, please? Uh, Yes, certainly. The, uh, the deal is a percentage share of revenue. It is a minority of that revenue. However, um, it is material to the IWM in terms of our running costs. And of course, what one has to consider is, is the total here rather than just a small percentage. £100,000 um, regular income to the museum is a, is a material concern to us and is worthwhile. Um, and we expect this to generate far more than that. Other than that, our commercial plans um, are, um, have been scrutinised. Um, they are reinforced and backed by Hilton, who will be branding this hotel. And we are confident that we will gain far more than that basic sum. Thank you. Is it possible to have a figure, Chairman? We've heard minority, it means practically 1%. Um, Chair, I'm, I, I, I'm hesitant because these are commercial issues yeah. and of sensitivity to us. Yeah. Um, and, and, and whilst I'm quite keen to cooperate, obviously, and give councils a full picture, um, is this material to the grounds for the planning application? I'll, I'll just ask the, the, the officer on that. Well, as I'm understanding, as I'm hearing, it's minority. So the question has been answered that that's a minority share. And please, if you could have. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I think um, the principle of the enterprise in supporting the operations of the airfield of the IWM is material to the consideration. The precise percentage of the agreement, in my opinion, is not. Um, the applicant has obviously advised us that. Uh, you know, the contribution will be significant in their consideration of how they operate the airfield. And I think that uh, is as far as the uh, question of, of precision should go in terms of the amount. Thank you, members. I think we can take that, that guidance. Thank you very much. Do we have another? We have two, Chair, Councillors Milnes and then Richard Williams. Councillor Milnes. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, we've just um, touched on my question, which was about viability. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got... It seems to me we've got two issues. Uh, one, the viability of the hotel itself, and then an associated issue, which is the viability of the airfield. And I just want to check that we can take both of them uh, into account, or, or, or just one of them. Thank you. I think that's a question to Chris Carter. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, the viability of the hotel is a matter for the applicant as the operator of the hotel. It's not, um, in my opinion, part of this consideration. The case that the applicant has put forward is that the hotel, under the terms of policy E7, which supports the general operation of the, uh, the uh, Air sorry, Air Museum, um, is that the, the operation of the hotel will support the general uh, financial viability of the wider operation of the site. Um, that is certainly uh, their case in putting forward an application for the hotel. And just to confirm, you're happy that he can take that into account as a material consideration? Yes. If, if you consider the, um, the policy E7, um, that looks at the needs and opportunities of the site as being material to consideration of any application. As I understand, it's a key consideration of our debate today in consideration of that planning application. And Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> thank you, Chair. This is not so much, uh, I think, a question for Mr. Brown, but it's maybe for members of Mr. Carter. Um, there was reference made um, in, in Mr. Brown's submission to um, the figures that, that we've got in this report being out of date in some sense. Could, 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 <coughs> can I just clarify that given that these are the only figures we've got, these are the only figures we can, we can rely on? Through you, Chair. Um, I don't know if Mr. Brown was referring to uh, the figures submitted on his behalf by his consultants or the figures referred to by the objector. Um, it may be that you wish to clarify that with Mr. Brown. Um, it is the figures referred to by the objector. We have provided market analysis that suggests that there is a vibrant and growing market in Cambridgeshire. Uh, and more recently, Turley's, our planning consultant, have provided a thorough analysis of the possible economic benefit of the hotel both of which are very positive. Thank you. I, I understood, Dr. Williams, this was about whether or not the information that we have in the report is such that we have the, the latest yeah. information to could, make it. Could I just flag up for the case officer when he comes back, which should be to clarify how, how this is fed into the report, that would, that would help us with the point that you've made. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown, for that. Oh. We have one more speaker, Chair, before Mr. Brown disappears. Councillor Khan. <laughs> the... Uh, Provision for access to the hotel, it's virtually all by road, everything, all the common. Uh, many people coming to conferences and hotels and events uh, would normally come by public transport. What provision has been made to uh, facilitate users coming to the hotel by public transport? Chair, would you like me to answer that? Yes, please. I think it's directed at you. Um, yes, we've, we've undertaken a thorough traffic survey. Uh, we have looked at the local transport hubs, especially at Whittlesford, um, and we are going to provide um, a rolling shuttle bus service in conjunction with others to facilitate transport to the main railway hubs. Um, and also, uh, we are looking at expanding that with other partners to other local businesses. So this is very much part of our agenda to make sure that we manage the traffic flows on the A505 um, and also to ensure Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any further questions? No further questions. Thank you very much. Um, we don't have um, any representation from the Parish Council or from local members this time, although we do have something in the report which is um, quoted and as part of the report from the local member there. So members will move into the debate and I will just open up with the clarification that um, Councillor Dr Richard Williams was speaking. And was that to the case officer? Yes, Chair. If the case officer could, could, could just com uh, confirm where those figures that were supplied by um, Mr Brown act actually feed into this report, that would be useful for me to get a handle on, on what he was actually referring to there. Yeah, hello. Yeah, so the figures referred to by Mr. Brown were in the Collier's report 2017, which was um, submitted with the application. There was a further report in 2020 um, and further information that was submitted in relation to the amount of events that will potentially be on the site in the next few years and also um, obviously number of conferences that may be held per year. Sorry, sorry to, to come back on that. 
Um, so where, where can I, I'm like, there's a lot of references for the pages, you know, uh, paragraph is very different and indeed that we're providing different figures. So, so could I find those figures in, in, in the report for it? Maybe, maybe me just not reading it right, but everything I'm reading seems to I think be we're, so, we're, we're getting a lot of, so what Richard Williams would like to know is, do, is there a reference, direct reference to the 2020 in this report, Karen? Sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not sure there is, but there is further information that has been submitted that has been outlined in the report. In my officer report. Yeah. But Mr. Want... Brown might be able to help on that. No, I think we're just asking in terms of the report that we have in front of us, Karen. That's what we're asking about. So do you want to direct us to a certain section in the report? Mr. Chief Justice. Chair, if I can help, possibly... Paragraphs 88 onwards on page 38 refers to 2020 trend report. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good. So, members, we're opening um, to the debate on this. As we know, this came to us before. Um, and it was proposed subject to certain conditions that were put in around the materials. After that, representations were made, which meant that it hadn't been heard, so it had to come back to us again. Then further representations around um, legal considerations, those were then again reviewed, and that's why it's been delayed, and it is with us today. So we are looking at it afresh. So we are looking at the principle of development. We have the, um, the key material considerations that we may look at, we are looking at what is in front of us now. And I think what we're hearing is this balance is between the greater public benefit to the sympathetic, um, to being to the setting and to heritage and appearance, any impact on that, and balancing impact on the local economy and businesses and this wider economy and potential new businesses, not just the local area, but the wider area. That's what I'm hearing, and the viability, perhaps, of um, the Imperial War Museum. We've got to balance all of these things together, I think, now in our, in our debate and see where we, um, where we land, members. So, opening the floor. Councillor Heather Williams first, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I feel as conflicted as I did last time on, on this because... Policy 7 is there for a reason. It's because we value the Imperial War Museum and, and everything that it, it does um, for our area and for, for former servicemen as well. Um, I'm not opposed to the principle of a hotel on the site or its location within the site. However, there are a couple of things that I am struggling with. The the appearance of the building in its shape, I do find makes it out of place with the other, other buildings. I can see what they're trying to achieve. I think efforts have been made, but I th and I think it will be difficult because of the amount of glazing that will be required for the bedrooms. But for it to curve up and then just stop and have a completely blank wall, looking at it in context of the other buildings, I'm, I'm not sure that it it really fits in as well as it could. It would have been better if actually the building, I think, had continued and perhaps had been a bit bit lower. Um, so I'm, I'm on the fence about that, but what more of a concern to me is that E7 does, you know, I, I'm looking at policy E7 mm -hmm. now, um, and viability is, is a key concern. We don't have a a viability assessment as such on the 168 room um, hotel. I think that's fair to say. I, I completely understand that um, any, any money that this can generate will support the museum. And I do understand, despite my probing, that about the percentages. The, the issue I have is a minority share can be such such a broad thing, anything between 1 and 49. Um, and I think without more information, maybe not the exact percentage, but without that information, it's very difficult to, to see whether E7 is applicable or not. Um, 
or that we're not being used by giving a, a nominal amount of money to the museum in order for somebody else to obtain a, a profitable business. Um, and the objective being that, as opposed to what E7 requires, which would obviously the objective is very clearly to, to support the museum. So I, I do feel that I'm lacking in information to be able to make that assessment reliably. Um, and I feel that actually, as has been said, that money will be so important to that museum that we are in danger of facilitating um, a, 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 I'm trying to be careful with the words I use, Chairman, but in danger of um, being taken advantage of in that way, and therefore our policy being taken advantage of in that way. Thank you. Thank and I'm you just chairman. reminding members on page five, if you look at page five, down at the bottom, which is if you count upwards, one, two, so it's um, three and four paragraph from the bottom upwards is um, transcript of the main part of policy E7. So there are you know, the two parts of that which are kind of being sympathetic to, um, to the particular needs and opportunities of, for the museum use or non-museum use, and it must be complementary to the character, vitality and sustainability, and also its um, contribution to the long-term future as a vibrant, sustainable and effective visitor attraction, education provider and commercial venue with jobs and investment beyond the direct effect of the museum and its partners. And I'm hearing, Councillor Williams, that for you, um, where you sort of in support of the development in principle and support of the location, um, but concerns about appearance and sympathetic to setting in terms of appearance and also about E7 and its application in terms of the viability to provide that vibrant future for it. Is that right? Chairman, Chairman yes, and I would say that actually it's the long-term viability that I'm, I'm concerned about because while, while the assessment might be for the short term, that we, if we're going to have a building like this, we want to know that it's going to support long-term and I don't think we have enough information to, to um, adequately assess Thank you. that. And I'd, I'll ask Chris Clark now, please, to provide. Thanks, Chair. I'm conscious of not interjecting in the debate too early, but here I go. Um, I, it's a really important point that Councillor Williams raises, and I think it's key to the debate, and that is um, policy E7 does not require the applicant to provide viability evidence. Um, the applicant has provided quite significant uh, information around how this hotel would fit in with their plans for the site uh, to maintain the sustainable uh, running of the site uh, into the future. Um, what, we, what members need to consider is um, the, the balance, really, between that uh, and any other impacts that may result, any other policy conflict you may identify, any other impact on uh, uh, other business operation um, and the economic impacts which may or may not result of that. Those are the things that need to be balanced, but it's important to know that the policy E7 does not require them to demonstrate with viability evidence how this would support their operation, um, albeit the applicant has provided other evidence to explain how this fits into their wider plans for the site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. And so in terms of the debate, it's, this is the applicant saying that it would provide the viability, and we're looking at the balance within policy E7 and on these other impacts that we've also heard from the public speakers as well in terms of impacts on, on the economy as well. Who do we have next? Uh, a raft of people, Chair, Councillors Roberts, Richard Williams, Milnes and then Fame. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I would just sort of remind myself um, again of the first presentation that we heard from um, the lady who was giving her opinion and I I have to say, I think her crazy of the situation was absolutely spot on. Um, and following on from Councillor Heather Williams, um, I too feel that, that the report is, is, is lacking in substance. I, I've got a feeling that as we are all, you know, we all know it's an, an excellent place and very important, but I think it's tempering um, our being objective. Um, it's, the hotel is not owned by the Imperial War Museum. Um, we do not know how up against the wall the Imperial War Museum is financially. Um, I know there's sort of general rumours around that part of 
um, the district about it, it, you know, not being as, as, as financially good as it was, but, you know, things have changed, haven't they? But I think that, you know, um, I think it's in the wrong place. Um, I can't believe that uh, there are better places on the land that the Imperial War Museum owns that would be less dramatic cause such a, an impact. I think it's purely been put there. So, Councillor Roberts, I'm going to try and help you that in that way, then it would be the principle of development for you um, that you would be objecting to because you, you, you know, and that you are also the impact on the character and appearance of the area. Is that right? Um, yes, Chairman, but I'd rather wait to just sort of word it myself. No, but I just think, I don't, want to, I don't want to be challenged again because we're not going to look at where else it could have been because we have to look at what's Yeah, before. well, uh, you know, it is, no, it is noted in the report by the historical buildings officer that she is, is saying she hasn't had it proven to her that there are other places yeah. on the site that would have been more appropriate. My feelings are that it's been just deliberately put where it's been put because that's where it will get maximum viewing um, and people will, you know, maybe think, ah, well, there's somewhere we can stop. I think that it is far too large. Um, I don't think uh, we've no uh, justification for a building of that size. We're, we seem to be saying that there were there was a report about five years ago. There might be a report now, but we don't know what on earth it says. Um, you know, and that's bad. That's bad of the planning committee to make decisions of a, a thing of this size, so out of character, um, and, and maybe with really no proven need um, and, and, and as a planning committee, um, go along with it. You know, we, we need to be yeah. more objective here. We, we should have had much more details. I understand the sort of commercial sensitivity of some of it, but we, we really should have had much more than we've got here. Um, I, I think it's too large. I think it's it placed in the wrong place. Um, I've no proof in my mind that um, the Imperial War Museum will even be able to continue functioning even with this. Um, and if it didn't, and if the Imperial War Museum was to close down here and move its airplanes elsewhere. Thank you, Councillor. Can I just, so if we, what we are hearing is, for you it is the scale, location, the impact on the appearance and character of the area. And for you, and therefore, no in policy E7, that doesn't, for you, provide enough um, grounds in terms of the harm that it there's, does for the public there's, benefit. There's, the no, there's no proven need. It, it, it is, in my opinion, a speculative application by a speculative Thank you. applicant. Thank you. Um, and, and it's going to um, be filled with people who are not so going to be anything to do with the museum. Thank chairman. you. I'm keeping you to the material considerations, but we hear very much for you. It's not providing for you sufficient grounds to show that the harm for you for scale, appearance, and location, um, there's not enough public benefit for the War Museum to guarantee that. Thank you. Next is Councillor Richard Wood. Yep. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm sort of sticking with the new procedure, and I've actually got some questions on clarification. Yeah. Can I come back then a bit later with, with the debate point? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I've got some clarification questions for the um, officer, if I may. Um, they, they, three of them, really. They all range around um, transport. Now, as we all know from the report, the local highways officer and indeed Cam Cycle um, have suggested that uh, there should be an upgrade to, to cycle access. I, I see the officer rejects that at 187 to 190. Um, but I just want to challenge that and get the officer's view um, because that cycle path, well, that path that's referred to as a shared footway cycleway is little more than a narrow pavement um, uh, along most of its length um, that it exists. Um, it requires you to cross two slip roads on and off um, the M11. I certainly wouldn't take my children cycling along um, that path, given the need to cross. So your um, question is? So my question is, um, can we have a little bit more detail about, about why this has been rejected? Because I, I, th th there isn't a sustainable transport option, um, in my view, given um, the inadequate nature of that path um, from the museum to the Clifford Parkway station. Um, so I'd like some more detail as to, to why that's regarded as adequate when, it, when in my view, it isn't. Um, the other point I wanted to clarify is about the signalised junction at uh, the entrance and exit to the IMW. Um, now, I'm sure as we all know, because we were there not that long ago, when you come out of the Imperial War Museum, 
there is a, a, a traffic light signal at junction, which is referenced in the report. But what I couldn't understand from the report is what impact, if there has been any impact assessment, um, on the fact that that signalized junction will be used if there's a hotel there 24 hours a day, whereas currently it is not. Currently, when the EINW is closed, the gates of that signalized junction are locked. So it is not used for a significant portion of time. But of course, if there's a hotel there, people are going to be coming and going all day. And I presume that that is a sensor-operated signalized junction. So that junction is going to be operating much more than it actually does now. Um, and I couldn't really get from the report whether there'd been any impact um, assessment on that. And then thirdly, um, the travel plan um, that was just referenced, um, or was referenced, I think, by Mr. Brown and was obviously referenced in the report, does um, concern me, um, particularly if it's proposed that there's going to be a rolling shuttle bus to and from Whittlesea Parkway. There is nowhere for a bus to access Whittlesea Parkway station safely. There is no bus turning. There are two narrow residential, well, on the one side, Station Road West, is a narrow residential road. There is nowhere properly for a bus to turn around there. The other side, Station Road East, is a very narrow road. Um, and again, there is nowhere for a bus to turn around on that road. So quite how will the um, shuttle bus um, operate if that is what is proposed? Because it seems to me um, not very well thought through and not really adequate and certainly not a sustainable transport option. So clarifications on those things would be very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, are you with us? I am. Hello. Hello. Did you get um, the three questions? Yeah. So with regards to the cycle path, we have to consider the, obviously, the users of the hotel. So some of those users will already be visiting the site for perhaps conference purposes, um, a tourist facility, etc. The other visitors um, will potentially have luggage and we think it would be obviously difficult to walk or cycle down that path with luggage. Therefore, we do not consider it reasonable to require that as part of the application. In terms of staff members that we have sought a shuttle bus to Whittlesford Parkway Station and other areas that will be able to accommodate um, sustainable transport measures. Um, so travel plan will be a condition of any consent, which will look into modes such as car sharing, future plans for additional buses, etc. There is a bus that goes from the Trumpington Road Park on the ride to the Duxford site at the moment, every one and a half hours, um, which is an alternative method of transport. Um, with regards to parking, uh, sorry, turning of a shuttle bus at Whittlesford Parkway Station, there is a station car park that perhaps could be potentially used for that. Um, at the bottom of Station Road West. Well, it's very narrow and they just put bollards to prevent it getting in there. Anything just flies, but um, yeah. So I, I Can I just clarify that if you're saying that that's part of the conditions, um, Karen, in terms of the sustainable transport plan that would include these measures, would that sustainable transport plan, if it was being presented, have to satisfy, you know, quite logical concerns that um, Dr. Richard Williams yes. is bringing up, you know, if it can't turn? But at the moment, we don't have that in front of us, but it would be a condition that would have to satisfy those. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So please note down the, those concerns and somebody knows the area well, actually. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we'll do. You did have one other question I don't think was answered, is that right? Yeah, it was the signalised so, junction and whether oh, there's been yeah. impact of that. So the local highways authority has obviously assessed the signalised junction, existing junction with the Imperial War Museum and does consider that the, obviously any new visitors will be within the capacity for that junction. Um, obviously, it's probably more well used at peak t peak times at the moment. Obviously, if it's open 24 hours, it will be during non-peak times where there'd potentially be um, additional traffic, which is considered to be within the capacity for that junction. Thank you. 
that fine, Councillor Williams? I'm not sure the questions were quite answered, but that's fine. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Next is Councillor Williams. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to um, support, as a relatively local uh, member, neighbour uh, to my colleague uh, Richard Williams, uh, everything you said. And I think particularly uh, I would reference the lack of cycled way uh, and a, a, a proper cycled uh, journey capability from either Duxford or uh, Littlesford or Pampersford or Salston. So These are all areas where staff could easily be located and without a, a, a proper cycle way, I think uh, that would be negligent to supporting our um, uh, agenda in that respect. The, um, the other issues that um, were raised earlier, um, I find um, difficult to support that there isn't a need for hotel accommodation. If you uh, look at Huawei, uh, Advent Bioscience, the Grant Park development and the genome campus, these are all being run. This is absolutely more uh, create, going to create more demand for hotel rooms in that area. And I think there's a very powerful case for the economic development of IWM, which has suffered, I believe, in terms of its income and profitability. It struggled. I remember two or three years ago when Andrew Langley was a local MP, him campaigning uh, for additional grant aid for the IWM because it wasn't making money. So I'm uh, very supportive of an opportunity for them to uh, actually um, become uh, more independently uh, uh, economically viable. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly uh, minded about the visual appearance of this. I think it's um, uh, <laughs> marginal at, at best. Um, but we've got a huge airspace hangar next to it that dominates that whole area. Um, and it really uh, is tucked away in between that and the, uh, the motorway junction. So I, I think the, uh, the um, visual appearance is, is, is marginal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and do we have, could I have just clarification in terms of what, the, the, what is being provided in terms of the cycle way? Yeah, just, um, just on that point, Chair, I think that the key is for um, if we to re request a cycle way, it needs to be proportionate to the impact of the development. And the modal split that is indicated in the transport work is such that there's very limited cycle uh, use to the site at the moment. That's not to say that it couldn't be in the future, but in order to justify requiring the applicant to pay for cycle path upgrades, I think it, there would need to be that evidence to support that, and that isn't there at the moment. Just with regard to the point that Councillor Dr. Richard Williams made about the junction, I think that is dealt with at paragraph 183, uh, sorry, 184, um, where that junction onto the A505 is discussed. Uh, there's comment about the capacity of the junction and, and whether or not uh, it would still operate um, within its uh, existing capacity. Uh, post-development, uh, and I believe the conclusion is that it, it would. So um, that's not to say there wouldn't be additional traffic passing through. There inevitably would, but but the junction is currently designed to be able to cope with that, according to the highway operator. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for those clarifications. Anyone? Uh, we have Councillors Fain, Khan, and then Roberts again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I, I do have some concerns about this application. Uh, the issues of sustainable transport have already been addressed, and I think we have to accept that that will be dealt with in the travel plan and will be important for the future to ensure that uh, all the additional modes are addressed, but I accept that is not essential to this particular application. Um, I had concerns about the cladding, and I'm glad to hear that the uh, change to light grey will be a condition which I assume is acceptable to the developer. I have some concerns, actually, about the uh, extent of renewables. Um, the old 10% rule is uh, pretty unambitious and very old, but, however, it does meet our current requirements, and that will be dealt with in the carbon reduction plan. Um, the question arose as to whether this should be referred to the Council's design enabling panel. 
um, the urban design officer said it was important that the architect presents the amended scheme to the council for review. However, the design officer has no objections to the scheme as amended. So then turning to the principles, and it was very helpful to have the key considerations set out by our case officer. Um, it is clear to me that in relation to the 1990 Act, the consideration as to the effect on listed buildings, that the site of this building is entirely separated from the uh, listed buildings on the site by the much larger airspace. Um, and I don't see the concerns on that as um, I think they are satisfied, um, as in the officer's recommendation. Then, looking at the question of the economic case for this um, and the room numbers, it is quite clear that this has been considered as part of a long-term master plan, which incidentally included Historic England as well as ourselves, and I think the development is very much in line with what has been called for, for instance, in the Cambridge and Peterborough Local Industrial Strategy, referred to at page, uh, 90, uh, page 98. Um, is it page 98, I think? Um, yes. Um, the, the size, I think that the number of rooms relates to the future needs, um, not only of this site, but also to other businesses around that were referred to by Council Mills. Um, and I'm satisfied that there is a good case to be made for a larger hotel as to the impact on other hotels. I was, I think, as we all were, very um, impressed and concerned by the points made by Sophie Gregoris of uh, Red Lion. However, looking at the trend report and the occupancy rates for the period to March 2020, which is the most recent we can reasonably take into account, we're talking about overall occupancy for a number of hotels around the area of approaching, in some cases, over 80%, which would suggest to me, and I think that is supported by the officers, that the, um, whilst the exact size of this is very difficult for us to say, there is a reasonable case to be made for a hotel of this size on this site. Um, in conclusion, there are very good reasons why we decided in the previous local plan that this should special consideration should be applied to this site and to this end. And I think it is quite clear that in line with that, a good case has been made for a hotel of approximately this size on this site, and that therefore we should accept the officer's recommendation and give delegated approval again. So thank you. So I'm hearing that you're heading towards um, the fact that the, the public benefit of this and the application of E7 outweighs any of the harms that you, you, yes. you have identified and recognised. That's why I referred to that point. Thank you. Next is Councillor Khan. Um, many of the points that I wish to make have already just been made by Councillor Payne, uh, which I uh, almost completely agree with. Um, but I, I will refer back to the size of the hotel issue again, which has been raised. Um, generally, we don't normally interfere in business decisions about viability. That's not normally something that the planning service would, uh, would consider. Um, I think the, the, the justification as outlined by Councillor Payne is something which I absolutely agree with. The, it, is, it's the right, it seems to be the right location on the site uh, with a minimum impact. Um, it seems to me that it's got the, um, that the attempt to be made at a sustainable travel plan, I was worried about that, that we were given a response on that issue. Um, it, it seems to me that it will make a contribution, uh, a significant contribution, whether it's a majority or minority doesn't matter. It seems to me, it's clear that the IWM thinks it's going to be important to its viability and that, that is as much as we can expect and we have to take their word on trust on that. Um, so the issue that was raised about the size of the hotel, whether it should be 168 beds or 120 or what have you. Uh, well, first of all, I want to look at the impact of a hotel which is 120 beds and on the scale of the building to that size area. I don't think the reduction of one floor to make it a 120 bed hotel would make any real difference in terms of the impact. Uh, I, I, these are large scale 
building the, the, in the environment and the site, uh, that won't make a, a significant difference. Once we've accepted a 128-bed hotel, I don't see any problem there. 168 as long as it doesn't rise higher than the adjoining buildings. Uh, so that uh, in terms of the effect on adjoining hotels, uh, the trouble is the high, uh, high occupancy. But uh, I think uh, I understand the concern of uh, nearby hotels, but I think actually it might increase their clustering rather than reduce it. When you have a system like this, it's going to introduce new, new people visiting the area because of the uh, conferences. I often went to conferences, found the hotel, official I think, hotel. I think we got, got your point, thanks. You can yeah, uh, often if you go to a hotel for a conference, other people go to other hotels which are cheaper in the vicinity. So I think they may actually find that there's, there's the a market segmentation. That the market segmentation, they will be custom, they will create new custom, and I don't know that that's something that we really, uh, we are able to be sufficiently concerned about to be able to use as a, re a reason for uh, objecting to it. So all these consider matters of concern. I, I think generally that I'm in favour of, uh, of supporting this application. Okay. Uh, with councillors Roberts, Hawkins and Richard Williams, but perhaps Councillor Hawkins, as we haven't heard from her yet. It's, it's also 11.30 and we've said we would have a 15 minute break. Um, so I suggest that we do that now, take a 15 minute break as we have multiple people, we've just seen one, one or two others gone on, but seeing as we've got a few people who want to speak. Um, 15 minute break, Aaron. Um, so those who are live streaming will take a 15 minute break. As we said, there's no ventilation in this room. It is important to take regular short breaks. We'll go out into the fresh air if we can, everybody. Um, and we will go out through that exit and come in through this one, make sure that we don't close the doors on our way in. Thank you very much, Aaron, again, for all your support. <laughs>
and it's nice to see you. We feel that we've overcome all the technical glitches, not us, but IT <laughs> support and their wider support. So thank you very much for that and for continuing to try. Um, so this is South Cam's District Planning Committee and we are on the agenda item dealing with the application for the um, hotel accommodation at Duxford Air Museum. And we have heard in the debate at the moment issues where there's some concern in terms of the balance between the public benefit to um, the future viability and thriving of the museum um, and the wider economy. In, and but concerns around perhaps appearance, being sympathetic to the setting, the scale, the location of this application, and also um, the substance, the substantive um, grounds on which somebody could take the argument that this does balance harm and benefit. And on the other side, we have also heard that um, there are members who feel that it's incredibly important for um, the future sustainability of the museum. So it does, um, they do see it as adapting and fulfilling policy E7 with some concerns perhaps from, by different members around the sustainable travel and we've looked therefore at the condition around sustainable travel and I'd like to come back to that just to make sure later members that that really is all captured there in the condition on sustainable travel. So I think it's condition Z and also wanted to confirm that um, there is recognition that there's been work done and additional work done on the color and materials for the cladding since the last time that this was presented to committee to take into consideration the concerns that committee had then. Um, I understand that Chris um, Hartley would like to say a few things to bring things into the debate to make sure that they are given full debate and, and hearing. And then we have four other members who have asked to speak. Um, and I'm going to give priority to two that haven't sp spoken. Um, but what I'd ask everybody is make sure that we're not duplicating any issues we're taking anything additional um, that will help us in the debate come to a decision members. So not rehearsing any of the things that have already been said. Thank you very much, Chris. Shall I start again? Do you want me to start again? Sorry. So, uh, so just following on from what Councillor Khan was saying um, before we took a break uh, around competition and that competition between businesses uh, per se is, is not a material planning consideration, but we should have regard to any potential economic impact uh, from a development. Now, my understanding um, is that the position of the proprietor of the Red Lion and the Holiday Inn is that um, there's the potential for this development to uh, result in a negative impact on the Red Lion. Um, it should be noted that the Red Lion as a public house um, is a protected village service or facility under the terms of policy SC3. Uh, their view is that if the Holiday Inn is affected, uh, the knock-on trade that they receive from the Holiday Inn uh, would have a negative impact on uh, the operation of the Red Lion. So that's just a point for members to consider the weight that they wish to afford to that. The second point that I wanted to make was around policy E20, which is with regard to tourist accommodation, um, and to highlight that there, um, and as I believe it sets out in your report, that there is uh, a degree of conflict uh, that members should consider here around uh, the location of the hotel and its size, uh, particularly point two of that policy, which states the following. Um, outside development frameworks, development to provide overnight visitor accommodation, holiday accommodation and public houses will be permitted by the change of use conversion and replacement of suitable buildings and by small scale new developments appropriate to local circumstances. Now I think it's acknowledged in the officer report that this is not a small scale building, uh, but it's for members uh, to consider the weight to be afforded to that conflict uh, having regard to the other considerations that have already been expressed. So I just wanted to highlight those two points there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that sort of input into our debate, which is important, because again, it's about sort of proportionality and weight, and we just need to make sure that these are properly considered um, as we, we make a final decision. Um, right here. Councillor Hawkins. Councillor Gotts, can you help, please? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I think, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you to the police officer, Karen L. Collins, for the uh, for the excellent report. It's detailed, uh, it was easy for me to, uh, to read and understand and follow. Um, and I know a lot of work has gone into this. 
Um, the second thing is I, I happen to be, I think, one of few people in this room who was on the planning committee when the Holiday Inn Express um, was uh, given planning permission and uh, had a feeling of deja vu with some of the um, comments being made about you know, viability and you know, the effect on Red Lion at the time was also a big, um, a big uh, issue. Um, but in, in retrospect, Holiday Inn Express has come into its own. <laughs> and I think that would be the case uh, with, this, um, with this proposal as well, if it is granted planning permission. Um, I think that it is in, uh, in line with policies uh, E7, 1 and 2. I have no issues with that at all. Um, and when I look at the fact that it is a uh, proposal that is actually supported by Visit East of England, um, as well as you know, one or two other um, uh, tourism bodies, it, it gives me um, hope that the economic recovery after COVID um, will be assisted with this particular hotel where it is. It is not small scale, but it is in scale with the site that it is at. That is my point, and that is why I will be supporting this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, in order, Chair, Councillors Richard Williams, Harvey, and then Roberts. Okay, sorry, Chair. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, these, these will be my, my debate comments. Um, I, I do have concerns about this running application, um, and I do put considerable weight on policy um, E20. This is not um, small scale or new development appropriate um, for local circumstances. It, 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 it's definitely not small scale. 120 bedroom um, hotel actually isn't um, small scale either, um, in, in, in my view, um, but um, maybe that would be, be justifiable. But uh, so my concerns are that we don't really have any evidence before us. We don't have any evidence before us to justify 168 bed hotel. We have evidence for 120 bed hotel, but we don't have any evidence for 168 bed hotel. And I am reluctant. To, to sort of go down the road of saying, well, 120 is, 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 is large, so we'll, we'll you know, increase that by 50%, and that, that's no different. Um, I think it is different, um, because it clearly could have an impact, uh, more of an impact on, on local businesses, as, as has been um, set out. So um, I'm also very concerned about the, the, the sustainable travel options. Um, I, I don't really think that um, Condition Z um, as it's currently worded, is, is, is viable. Um, it, it, it's just not possible to have a shuttle bus that leaves the Littleton Parkway. Um, there is nowhere for a bus to go um, and to turn, and, and it will cause all sorts of problems if we try to um, put, put uh, a bus down, down that road. Um, so I don't actually think that is um, a viable option um, at the moment. Now, um, weighing all of that in balance, at the moment I'm minded um, to vote against this on the basis of um, E20, taking account of E7, and obviously we want to support AMW, but given this is a 168-bed hotel, we don't actually have any evidence about the um, why a 168-bed hotel is, is, is needed. So uh, in the context of, of the sustainable travel plan, I don't think it's satisfactory and viable at this point. Um, at the moment, I'm weighing in favour. Now, what might tip me the other way is if we could do a little bit more about sustainable travel, um, because uh, I think if we could, it might make it acceptable, um, in my mind, um, if we could have some, for example, increased provision in, in cycling, um, and some, uh, which I think would alleviate the concerns about sustainable travel. Um, that would make it more acceptable, in my view. But as things stand at the moment, um, I, I'm minded to vote against on the basis that we don't have any evidence to justify 168 bed. It's clearly in front of the E20, and I don't think the um, sustainable travel um, plans are viable. Thank you. Councillor Harvey, next. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I generally am supportive of this on the basis that um, this kind of facilitate, and the development facilitates a sort of more than a trip up from London kind of uh, tourism that we've been sort of um, struggling with for, for many years. And I think I had occasion to visit the American Cemetery, which is just a scoot up the road, and you can sort of start to see that there's a sort of basis of a two-day um, stay in Cambridge there, if you put all those things together. Um, I did actually uh, drop my son off at um, Whittlesford Station um, about six, no, I think that was 18 months ago, I suppose, before the pandemic, and um, ended up having to give 
an American couple a lift to Duxford because they'd arrived at the station and couldn't work out how to get there, um, especially with some very real footpaths. So I think um, this adds um, sort of critical mass, um, uh, notwithstanding um, Councillor Dr. Williams' um, observations on the shuttle bus. I think if this results in a shuttle bus, that would not only um, add to the viability of the hotel, but also the viability of um, Duxford as an attraction. Um, I think um, this kind of um, leisure activity um, is a sort of economic development that we need um, because it doesn't involve material consumption. That's obviously in line with um, our 2050 zero carbon target. So I think um, we're very much aligned in that sense. Um, the only um, issue I would have in terms of what's before us is I noticed in the informatives um, on page 60, um, there's a lot of um, discussion around the additional noise impact from the hotel on uh, the, the neighbors to the site. Um, presumably that includes construction, but also operation, uh, air conditioning units and so forth. But um, it's sort of puzzling to me that uh, the, the obverse um, problem hasn't been considered given what a noisy environment um, Duxford is. And of course, part of the attraction of Duxford is that it is a working airfield um, as, as well as um, a museum. And that's kind of part of its unique attraction. I mean, I would be um, concerned that given that the hotel will not uniquely be um, sort of housing uh, or hosting um, air um, or historic air kind of uh, enthusiasts, if you like, um, that it, it would be a shame if commercial pressure were applied to the museum to curtail their sort of live flying um, you know, for example, if, if somebody... Dr. Harvey, I think you've got your point. Yeah, so okay, you're, you. you're a bit concerned about the informative, which is not a condition, it's an informative, but there is within the conditions, there are conditions around noise. Okay. I think you're right. So you, know, you just have a concern as to whether or not, you know, in the design, but we have to look at what's there. You know, you, I, I don't think you could change that right now. You would have to okay. say whether or not you're in line with the, you know, the principle of development and all of the other issues that we've said. Yeah. Um, but to, to change okay. the design or the balance of how the commercial balance of that impact on noise is quite a design issue, isn't it? So it's a bit big to change it at the moment. So we'd have to sort of look at what's in front of us, yeah? Yes, okay. You turn yours, yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, just to reassure Councillor Harvey, I think that uh, that informative relates to the operation of uh, plant and equipment at the hotel. Uh, which is quite a different type of noise to the kind of noise you'd expect with a, an operating airfield. So uh, it's concern around low level background noise, which might be more disturbing to people who live nearby. Whereas obviously if you see a plane, you expect it to have some noise for a period of time and then it goes away again. So I think it's just an informative to, to deal with that kind of issue more so than the, the more uh, short term noise that you get through aircraft, for example. I think you probably understood that. He was just giving that. It's, just, it's a noisy place. Good. Um, do we have any other? Two more, Chair, Councillors Roberts and then Griffith. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for allowing me to come back, but I think you tipped me off balance last time, so I didn't quite get my ideas in focus. Um, it, it, it's just, I think everybody here wants to see the museum continue and do better than it is, it is at the moment and, and support some of, sort of um, uh, hotel accommodation there on site. As I said, I think it's far too large and I think it's in the wrong place. But I don't think we are giving due consideration to um, the historical uh, aspects of uh, the museum. At the moment, it's quite clear when you drive along from any direction there that it's primarily a museum for aircraft. And all the buildings there are associated with that and fit in with each other. And at page eight, um, the officer, the historic uh, officer, is saying, the MPPF is clear that great weight should be afforded to the assets conservation and that clear and convincing justification is required for harm. Now, I think that there is harm here because of the size of it, because of where it is. I think it's a, a great distraction from what the museum should be certainly is at the moment about I think to put a hotel of that size of that dimension of that um, uh, design is 
terribly harmful in that particular place. It's being clearly, it's, it's what a developer does. He's putting it in the place not to benefit the museum, the Imperial War Museum, for himself. It's the main place for it to be seen. That's all it's about, the main place. And that's speculative, and I don't think we should be allowing that. Um, I think we should say no to this, but give them the clear um, understanding that we are um, supportive of a hotel, smaller, um, and a better design, and not um, in conflict with what the, um, the museum is about. It's, it, it was there in World War I and World War II, and it's always been clearly defined as, for, especially for the villages like where I live, roundabout, it's, it's for aircraft. That's what it's all about. It's about old aeroplanes and about history. This is a speculative applicant putting in a speculative application for something that will harm all those nearly, a, well, over 100 years of what that place has been about. Okay. We shouldn't be playing that game. We need to take control. We are not there to act as agents for speculative applications. Thank you. We're there to be the deciding planning authority. Thank you, Catherine. And Roberts. follow like, our own rules. I think that's, it's very, very important what you've brought into the bank is a material consideration, which is about the heritage assets. And we do take into serious consideration, everybody, what the um, heritage officer has said. And I think Catherine Roberts has brought that to us. So again, you know, this is why they're here. We have difficult decisions. We have to bring these things into balance and say, you know, in terms of the harm versus the benefit, you know, where, where do we fall down on those things? Um, and I think what I've heard is there's definitely different opinions. Um, there's some people who are still this, perhaps not quite decided yet, but I've heard some people who are definitely um, leaning towards not approving this, while some are definitely um, leaning towards approving it. If there isn't anything else, I would move. Oh, did we have I was oh, going sorry, to, it's okay. I was going to suggest, shall we move to a vote? Because I feel like I've heard all the arguments. We didn't prepare first. that in advance. I'm yeah. sorry, Councillor Richards. Okay. And I hope that was. Fresh. That's absolutely fine. Good. You'd like to move to a vote? Thank you. If everyone's agreed with that, members, we move to the vote. And the vote is... Um, I just need, if we're going to, we yeah. to vote, we need to be clear on what any reasons for refusal would be. Yeah. Um, so I've heard from Councillor Roberts very clear reason around um, heritage impacts, um, particularly the size, location, appearance of building, um, harmful impact on the setting of grade and two. And I think also, I think Councillor Roberts is clear in terms of saying that this is going to be very difficult to actually monitor. I'm sorry. Uh, I think lighting should also be, Chairman, it is within the report of concerns about it being. Um, the illumination, the amount of illumination, in comparison to what there is there now, it's going to be a very different aspect if it goes through. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, so with the addition of lighting, Chair, and that there be a harmful impact on the setting of the Grade 2 star and Grade 3 listed buildings, as well as the character and appearance of the conservation area, that would be contrary to uh, the National Planning Policy Framework, Section 66 and 72 of the Planning Listed Building Conservation Areas Act, uh, and our own local plan policy. And then... I'm wondering if there's another reason from council which is yes. What we have, which we've got, so in, in the E20 policy E20 in terms of scale for the tourism development, that was one of the other reasons provided. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so it's the conflict with uh, part two of policy E20, and it's the, the scale of the different operations. Yep. Yes. So those are the reasons that I also had um, down. In terms of sustainable travel, we have um, the travel plan, which is in condition Z, um, which is there. And I think what we've heard from today is as well that we, depending on the decision, and if that were to move to approval, that that um, be taken into account all of the comments that have been made here in the completion of that sustainable travel condition. Members, we're moving to... I'll turn mine off. Thank 
you. Um, I appreciate I was some time ago at the start of it, but I did also um, on my opening remarks in the debate said about the design of the building not being in keeping and therefore creating harm to the setting. So I just wanted to make sure that was included. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, so in my summary of Councillor Roberts. I just wanted to say. Uh, just in my summary of Councillor Roberts' comments, um, I did include the uh, size, location, and appearance, as well as lighting. Um, is there a design point beyond beyond that? And what is it about the design that you would find objectionable? Um, my my issue was the, the design and the fact that it had a sheer sheer block face at the end, the way it came up, and the fact that I found that quite ob obstructive and not in keeping with how we see the others with um, roof alignments, etc. Through you, Chair, I'd probably pick that up as a third reason then, uh, as a design reason, rather than it necessarily being related to the heritage impact directly. Uh, so, yeah, with approval, officers would uh, draft the reason and agree with the Chair and Vice Chair associated with the comments we've made, Councillor Williams, around design. Thank you. Just, uh, thank you, Chair. Just, just come back very briefly on that point about sustainable travel and, and as, as much for the public record as anything else, but, but it may be a, a reasonable concise. I mean, it, that is the crucial factor for me. I'm not actually um, convinced that's tra tra uh, that travel planning can actually work and that's what tips the balance for me, really, given everything else. Um, I'm not sure if that can be cited in terms of, um, I mean, I, I'm personally not, not convinced that we, we can, that, that will comply with PR3, but I'll, I'll defer to Chris Carter as to whether that should go as an official reason or not. My view would be not, Chair. Um, there's a condition that requires a travel plan. It's cited in the applicant's travel plan, and that condition would need to be discharged. If they're unable to comply with those uh, requirements of the condition, then we would deal with that as adverse. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, nobody else. So we'll now move um, to the vote. And so the recommendation. On page 53 at the bottom, which is delegated approval subject to the following conditions and informatives, together with a section 106 to secure a commuted sum towards maintenance of the keep clear markings on the M11 Junction 10 roundabout. And then the conditions follow in the preceding, in the, in the following pages. So members, please, if you press blue, first of all, your blue figure on your controls, and we will vote for that recommendation, against or abstain. Can we take... Yes, I'll do, it. I'll do that again by hand, I think. Is that okay, Aaron? We're going to take that down. We'll do it by hand. Can you just take, take up the screen as well? Thank you. So, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Against? Abstain? Chair, that's um, eight votes in favour and three votes against. So the commission is delegated authority is granted subject to one member. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. And we'll move now to agenda item six in page 63 in your papers. And this is for application reference number 20 slash 05250 slash OUT, it's in Linton, <coughs> excuse me, um, 35 Bolsham Road. The proposal is for the outline planning application for the erection of a single self build dwelling with all matters reserved. An outline planning application with all matters reserved. The applicant is South Cambridgeshire District Council. So our key material considerations are principle of the development and highways, given that this is an outline planning application. It is not a departure from our policies. Um, and it's being brought to the committee, as is um, our constitution, because it's owned by South Cambridgeshire District Council. So this is for reasons of transparency and conflict of interest that it's being brought before us. 
as usually these type of applications would probably not normally to get to us. Um, do we have the case officer with us, which is Jane Roden? Jane. Good afternoon, Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you very well, Jane. I'm just Perfect. Okay. Shall I start with the presentation? Thank you. Can I confirm that you can see that presentation? Yes, perfectly. Perfect. Okay. So thank you, Chair. This application is for outline planning permission for the erection of one self storage dwelling with all matters reserved. Uh, the officer's recommendation as per the officer report is for approval subject to conditions. So the application is adjacent and it's number 35 Bolsham Road. Um, on the site location plan, that's the area in blue. The application site is the area in red. Uh, as part of the application, there's been an indicative block plan submitted and indicative elevations, which are currently in front of yourselves there. I've taken some photos of the site. Um, so currently on the site, there's a substation to the front. So you can see it's that area that's outside the red line in front of my little arrow on the right hand side. On the left is number 35 uh, Bolton Road and on the, the right is number one Wybie Close. Uh, myself stood the back on the other side of the road, looking towards the site, uh, number one, Bribey Place on the right, um, the gates to the substation in the middle, and then number 35, Bolsham Road on the left. So this is the current uh, beginning of the site. The substation is just on the right hand side there, Bribey Place in the background, and Bolsham Road at the front. Uh, same photo again there. and stood back again across the road, looking at the site, the substation in the front. The site you can see the grass at the back and then the two properties either side. Same photo again. As the key material planning considerations already said by yourself are the principle of development and highways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. And we'll move directly to public speakers. If there are any questions from members to you, we'll come to those in, in the debate. Um, I'd like to know if we have Tony Dixon with us. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you perfectly. And as I understand, there is also Claire Darling, who is also a, another neighbour, who will be here if anybody has additional questions. But you will use the three minutes, Mr Dixon. Yes, I'm going to be representing Claire's statement as well and reading that out, if that's okay. That's fine. Thank you very much. Um, and so, if you'd like to introduce yourself, and we've got three minutes, and um, Mr Carter here will help me with the timing. Thank you very much. Lovely. As mentioned, I'm Tony Dixon. I live at number one, Rivey Place, which is a neighbour. I'll read my uh, neighbour, Claire Darling's objection statement first, who lives at 35 Bolton Road. It has been stated that all lorries delivering materials onto the site must turn around and exit driving in first gear off the site and not reversing onto the road. Due to the size and access to the plot, this would not be practical, safe, or in the case of size of some larger delivery vehicles, not even possible. To enable smaller delivery vehicles to turn around on site, they would have to turn in our front garden outside our front door. This is causing a serious concern for the safety of our children and ourselves. This is also not taking into account where our own cars will be parked at this time. And whilst the delivery vehicles are dropping off materials, we won't be able to have access to our drive as there will be no space for access or parking. Also, as it has been stated that workers stroke builders' vehicles are to be parked on site. This will make it even more unvi unviable for deliveries to be made due to the limited access, parking areas and dangerous blind bend in the road adjacent to the site causing much concern not only for the safety of our family, but also the general public. Our other main concern is the amount of light that we lose in our kitchen if there is another dwelling next door. We have already lost 50% um, of our natural light since the fence was erected just a metre away. We have often have to have the lights on during the day, more so in the winter months due to the restriction in light, which will only get worse with the position of the proposed building, with us having to incur an increased electricity bill for the increase in lighting this area. We are also mindful of where any windows may be positioned in the new property and if we are going to be overlooked and lose our privacy. 
That's from Claire Darling. Uh, my objection statement is um, I object to the proposed planning application for the following reasons. My wife runs a child mining business from home and we're extremely concerned about the noise, inappropriate language and building dust that could be created during the build and the negative effect this would have on the children and staff, especially as our Velux windows run alongside and garden area adjacent to the proposed dwelling. Due to the position of the planned property, it would impact on our light and privacy with the rear windows looking into our back garden and through our Velux windows. This is particularly relevant in regard to safeguarding the children we look after. Finally, our third objection is in relation to the increased risk of traffic accidents during the delivery of materials and or parking of work vehicles off-site and outside our property. With parents frequently dropping off or picking up children, I'm concerned that this could lead to a serious accident or even worse, a fatality. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, members, do you have any questions? Yeah, Councillor Spain, Roberts, and then myself, Chair. Councillor Spain. Thank you. Um, yes, my, my question would relate to the, the child, the impact on the child mining business, particularly of deliveries given the limited space. And I'm just wondering if there is a particular time of day when, for instance, parents would be dropping off children. Uh, and whether a condition as to the timing of deliveries to the development of the site might be an appropriate way of addressing this. Um, I, the problem that I have is that with the parents picking up at different times, and this varies from day to day, um, it would be hard to allocate set times for, for deliveries, especially having uh, no more deliveries are like myself as well. They don't always turn up um, at those set times. Um, so that could be um, quite challenging, I think, doing that. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Madam Chairman, thank you. <coughs> um, uh, I wonder if the gentleman could tell me, um, I've got two questions, but one would be back to the offices. If the gentleman could tell me how many children are actually attending um, this facility um, each day and then to the officers, um, as we've had comments made about um, the effect on lighting, could we see the photographs again, please, um, of the site, which would show us both um, houses on either side. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we have a number of children um, attending before school from 7.30 in the morning um, for breakfast club uh, and also nursery children. Um, we also do an after school collection, so we have after school children collected from the schools as well, um, and that's right up until six, six o'clock. So, again, with deliveries being outside those times, I think it, before half seven is unrealistic and probably after six o'clock um, as well. In regard to numbers, our nursery children, um, it can be anything um, from eight to sort of ten children um, during the day. And um, within the morning, we have um, some of the nursery children there, but also in addition to that, we do have pre, uh, sort of school children that we then drop off at school. And the same with collection of children after um, can be anything to um, eight, eight or nine children uh, minimum after school. Um, and also taking into account, obviously, current circumstances with ventilation, um, we are currently spending a lot of time outside and also with the Velux windows open, so um, that obviously is a concern as well while the children are there. Thank you, thank you. Uh, to myself and Councillor Heather. Your question is open to somebody else for that. Um, it, it, would, it would help me, Chairman, then to see the photographs again, because if this gentleman is talking about eight children, um, I presume his property must be the one that had, I think, the sort of um, side extension, uh, single story side extension, because the other side was just a blank wall. So I, I would like to see that photograph, if I may, Chairman. Thank you. Shall I pop the map? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Can you see that photo there? You can. So it says rising close on the right hand side if the windows that's, that's, there. That's the that's the um, children's facility, is it? That single story. Yeah. Okay, but obviously there is a fence there already, so they can't be getting much light. I think anyway. That's what he said. He's already lost fifty percent. He said during his. Yeah. 
Thank you. Do you have, I'll ask the question for the officer, Councillor Roberts, when we get round to the office. We have more questions for either Mr Dixon or um, Mr Diamond. Yeah, my question's for, for Mr Dixon. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen the agenda papers that we have in front of us, but one of the recommendations where should approval be granted would be that a traffic management plan would have to be in place before any construction took place. That would dictate when deliveries are, where they park, how they turn around, etc., etc. Um, I just wanted to ask, given all the concerns you've raised already, do you think that would actually mitigate some of those concerns, or do you think that uh, having something like that wouldn't actually help at all? I, I think if, if looking at the site and you see the space that's available uh, and the bend in the road, um, it, it would, yeah, it would be um, unsafe for deliveries to be made from the roadside. And I don't think, looking at the space, there there is anywhere near enough room. Um, for deliveries to be made on site, so especially okay. a large articulated lorry um, delivering timber, bricks, and, and so on. Um, I, I've, I think that would be highly unlikely that they would be able to make deliveries on, on site, especially with uh, workmen's vans and, and, and builders' vans and so on Thank um, you, on site Thank as you, well. Mr. Dixon. Yep. Uh, we have Councillor Heather Williams. Um, through yourself, Chair, and very thank you, Mr. Dixon. A lot of your, your representation has obviously been about the construction phase of the development. Um, and I, I do recall that you said about windows. Um, but if I could just ask, on the, the principle of having a dwelling there, if it was to just appear, as it were, um, and get dropped in, is that something that is of concern? Or is that something that you're agreeable to, that it's the construction and the windows that's the issue? Thank you, Chairman. Um, in answer to that, it, it concerns us even once the construction is made because of our Velux windows and, and the rear windows looking at the plans um, that would face into those and into the garden as well. Um, obviously, with the safeguarding of the children we look after, um, being precedent, we have to be very careful of that. So that, that is, a, is a concern as well and the privacy um, too. Thank you very much. No more questions. Thank you very much um, to both of you for coming and, and speaking. Um, we'll now hear from the Parish Council and we have Enid, is it Bayed? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, look, I can't read the eye on there. Sorry, sorry. You're not both. <laughs> Hello, thank you for being, no, no, don't pay much. <laughs> thank you very much for being with us, Councillor. And um, can I ask you if you have permission from, authority from the Parish Council to represent us? I think a lot of my points have actually been covered, but I'd just like to press, um, in principle, the Parish Council had, was okay with this, but you have serious concerns. The first of all is the ownership. Um, this was the garden of a South Camps house, and um, there is a substation on site, and we'd like to confirm that all of the land does belong to South Camps, and can be handed over to a new owner. This is partly because of ownership issues in the future, the legal issues regarding ownership, particularly on the shared driveway. We've already had problems in the village regarding similar issues, and the shared driveway is raising concerns. Also, is there enough parking on site with the shared driveway? We see three, three vehicles there already, and I did doubt that there's going to be sufficient parking on the shared driveway. Um, also, is access and a vehicle tracking plan part of the application? Um, that's been raised previously. Um, we had concerns regarding the safety of the substation. It's an open area. It's fenced, but it is not covered. And um, one of our Councillors is an electrical engineer, and he raised doubts about the safety of such a structure so close to buildings. Um, the visibility displays for cars and pedestrians raise concern, particularly on this corner and with the childcare facility next door. We want to see better displays for particularly children running across the access. Um, the, also, when we get the actual design, 
We have concerns regarding the privacy, overshadowing, loss of light, loss of immunity for the care of murders. And murders will be brought up later, but um, we do have great concerns that there might not be an overdevelopment of the site. And um, um, also, we would want a condition that said that the construction vehicles did not come through the centre of the village, which is the conservation area. We know the difficulties and the damage that this can do. So we have concerns, great concerns, most of which have been raised, but we are reiterating them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor. <coughs> And um, I will open to questions, but I will confirm, though, and as we've seen in the report, that anything about um, the scale, character, appearance, immunities, impact on immunities, we can't look at now because that's reserved matters. So the impact on the neighbouring properties, we can't in those terms. What we're looking at is the principle of development itself for an outline planning application and the issues in terms of highways. But you did have a couple of questions, and so we can put those to um, the officer, I don't know if the case officer. Um, Jane, if you are there, so the, can you confirm that all land is owned by South Cambridgeshire, the applicant, South Cambridgeshire District Council? As far as best my knowledge, I believe it is. That's what was submitted in the red line plan as part of this application and the blue line that's associated with it. Thank you. And including the shared driveway, just, just to double, doubly confirm. Yes, so the driveway was part of the red plan. Sorry, I'm just getting that in front of me now. And the application form. I'm having a IT moment this end. Don't, don't worry, Jim. What we can do is we can see if there are any questions while you're looking for that, that red line. We'll if, if that's all right, over two seconds. That's fine. Do we have any other questions? Up to Councillor Mills. Councillor Mills. Actually, it's related to this issue of that red line because I, I was trying, I was struggling to uh, see the location of the um, substation and where the access was going to be uh, made. And it, it looked like that red line went straight in front of the adjoining property. And I, I, so I was quite... Well, let's wait till we get the red line on that one, shall we? Come back to your question. Thank you. So my question, Chair, is for the, for the Parish Council. Um, same question as I gave to the public speaker. So we have a raft of conditions that are recommended should approval be granted relating to traffic management, visibility displays, the driveway itself. I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that, if you thought they were enough to, to mitigate the development. Um, we have issues regarding displays, whether they're sufficient, considering the childcare centre next door and the fact that this is on the bend. Um, we also want um, a condition regarding deliveries or the construction, that they should not go through the village centre, the conservation area. Um, sorry, what else was there? <laughs> no, that, that's fine. So we'll see if one of the members picks that up in terms of, a, you know, for the, that would be the construction management plan, I think. That, yes, um, there's, no there's no construction management There's no construction management plan. And there's no tracking plan regarding vehicle movement. Can we just check that the, as I understand it, the condition around pedestrian visibility displays is saying two metres by two metres shall be provided. That's the condition that's in here in the papers. Yes, it's a difficult site and with the traffic of particularly the small children and drop off and parking on the corner and such like um they need to be perhaps rather more than that to give adequate sight lines thank you Catherine. jane are you still with us i am with you sorry about that chair um so with the red line um in the application that's been submitted it shows that there's it's owned by south cams everything that's within the red line i can get the red line back up again if that helps. Yes, please. Thank you, Bridget. So this is the site location plan. Can you see that chair? Yes. So site location plan on the left and block plan on the right. Um, this area here would be where the substation is. And the green on this plan is the visibility displays, the two by twos that have been requested 
Um, in regards of the other disabilities phase, this application did go back out to consultation uh, with the highways department to revise the site location, the site disabilities phase, and highways have confirmed that there's no objection to those. They go across the road either side. Is that all the questions to yeah, myself, sorry, Chair? From, I'll just check with Councillor Mills. Yeah, so I'm just trying to understand um, the layout of that red light because that would uh, suggest that this property um, actually um, is directly in front of the adjoining property to this uh, development. Is that correct? So the property proposed indicatively on this block plan, which would be up here on the right hand side, if I go to the indicative block plan um, on here. This would be the proposed potential location for a house here. There's potential parking um, to the north of it. The red line extends down here to include the, the spaces that will be available for um, number 35, as indicated on here. So That's where the red line goes in front. There would have to be an agreement between uh, the residents at number 35 and and I think that's outside our, those private arrangements are outside planning committee's okay, consideration. Fine. All right. Uh, but that's, that, they were much better uh, drawings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, that clarification. I think that's answered your question as well, Councillor Ball. I don't think we have any other questions for you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, and we, local members, Councillor Henry Batchelor, would you like to speak now during the debate? I'll speak in the debate. Thank you. Good. Uh, we're open to the debate now. Members. Councillor Hawkins and then Councillor Ball. Um, thank you, Chair. I think um, actually perhaps through you, Chair, if I might ask um, the case officer, was Highways aware that there's a child minding business next door? I asked the question because I've had a similar situation in my ward where they were not aware of something that should have been. Mm -hmm. Um, which has caused the existing residents some issues. Mm -hmm. So perhaps they could clarify if they were aware of that or not. Uh, otherwise, um, the principle of development, as far as I'm concerned, is okay. Um, but the highways issues definitely uh, would like an answer on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jane, do you have an answer to that? I don't specifically, so I'm just going through my emails with highways to see if they were specifically aware of child minding facilities. Yeah, and Chris, Same. Would have, while, while you're looking. Chair, through you, um, I think the, the concern of the highway authority will be whether or not adequate pedestrian visibility at the entrance to the site can be provided. They're clearly satisfied that it can, um, notwithstanding what's going on in other properties around, it's what, it's what can be achieved at that, that access point. So. Um, whilst I take the point that Councillor Hawkins is, is making, that there will be children nearby, there could be children in other neighbouring properties. Um, so I think the key thing is, can they provide that two-by-two two visibility display? They've shown on the plan that they can. The Highway Authority is satisfied with that, and it's been told by the position. So I think that deals with the, the issue itself. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think on... Sorry. Is that better? IT day for me today. Um, I think the you know to be really clear that the building where it is and all of that is is completely indicative. So there's no guarantees that that will be what comes forward in the next round. I just think that's important to stress. Um, and so not looking at where the building is and, and that sort of thing. I think on highways. We've got the response, as has been said, from County Council, the technical advice, which would be difficult for us to, to object with. So we've only really got the principle of development to, to be addressing. Um, I think it will be a squeeze to get a dwelling in there. I, I don't think it's um, going to be an easy thing to do, but I do think it probably can be achieved with some um, very... Um, outside thinking design um, and I think that it needs particular when it comes to the next round and we're actually looking at the design I think officers really need to take on board 
its proximity to the other buildings because with, <coughs> yeah, with the exception of, of how close they are, you know, it is going to be tight. Um, but I think it's achievable just. Uh, myself and Councillors Fane and Griffithshire. Okay. So I actually have two questions for officers. Um, one was around the parking spaces. I believe the plan is to use the current parking spaces in front of number 35 for the new dwelling. I just wanted to ask officers if the loss of parking spaces in front of the existing dwelling number 35, if that was a material consideration we could give weight to today or if that was more for the reserve matters later down the line. Um, and the second question was we heard from the parish about the lack of a construction management plan. Again, I wanted to ask if officers would be open to adding that into the list of recommendations we have should approval be granted. Good, Jane. Can you hear me okay there? Yeah. So two questions. So with, the, mm -hmm. so with the first one about the parking spaces, um, on the indicative plan that's been submitted, it shows two parking spaces for number 35 Bolton Road, just out the front of it to the right hand side, and then two spaces for the new dwelling on that site, with both, so all four spaces would be, would be within that red line. Um, our policy in the local plan says that there needs to be at least one space within the curtilage of the property, so there would there'll be two spaces per um, dwelling for that, so officers would be happy in that respect. I think the question is whether or not that's material to now to the outline planning. Also, no, sorry. Um, so it would be all matters reserved, so car parking would come under the, the reserve matters application. Thank you. And in terms of the construction management plan condition that was being um, recommended by the parish council, if this were to be approved, is that possible for officers to come up with one which was about no construction traffic going through the conservation, coming through the conservation area? I think that was the request. Chair, if I might take that one. Um, I, I, in my opinion, that's not reasonable. Um, yeah, the public highway does pass through the conservation area. Notwithstanding the concerns of the parish council, I don't think it would be reasonable to try and restrict the route of traffic to the site in that respect. This is an application for a single dwelling uh, and no more than that. So I think it would be disproportionate to, to route traffic elsewhere for an application for a single dwelling, in my opinion. Okay, that answers the two questions from Councillor Emma Batchelor. Next speakers, we have Councillors Fane and then Griffith. Good, and I think then we could move to a vote with the second. Chair, um, I have to conclude that on the question of highways, this would be one development too many on this sensitive corner both short term in terms of getting construction vehicles in and out safely and long term bearing in mind the arrangements with the property next door this as Councillor Mills has pointed out would involve uh, shared space between what would otherwise be their front garden um, but also because of the I think it is a material consideration that there is an existing child minding business next door and um, a number of impacts on that business but particularly my concern would be safety of children in relation to dropping off and collecting children next door. And so reluctantly in this case, I think it would be, uh, I would be inclined to reject the officer's recommendation and uh, refuse the application. Next speaker chair is Councillor Griffith and then Richard Williams. Um, and Council, and we, we are, I think we will then go to a vote on this one. After yeah, a Councillor Peter Fane has actually just um, voiced what my concerns were. So I think on balance, I will be rejecting. Can I ask a question to um, Chris Carter in terms of that particular reason for objection? And then to the construction phase that leads you to that conclusion or the addition of a an additional dwelling in this in this location and the operation of the access to that dwelling that's been turned out. Chair, if I may, my concern related, related to both. Both the practicality of getting vehicles in and out for construction without in, uh, harming safety on the sensitive corner, and also the impact, particularly on the child mining business next door, uh, in the longer term. Thank you. Um, I mean, my, my view, Chair, would be um, in the light of the comments of the Highway Authority, uh, not objecting to the application, that that would be quite a difficult reason to uh, defend. Um, there are measures that could be put in place through the, uh, the condition uh, with regard to delivery to the site that could be controlled further by the council and, and agreed under the terms of the condition. 
Uh, in terms of um, the increase in use of the access, as the case officer showed on the plan, there'd be two spaces either side, two for the existing dwelling, two for the new dwelling. Um, that intensification of use clearly, in the, in the opinion of the highway authority, is not so significant that it would cause uh, a significant impact on highway safety, which is the test after all. Um, so I would be concerned that that isn't the strongest re reason for refusal. That's not to say you couldn't go down that route if you wanted to. Clearly, that's your prerogative, but that would be my advice. Okay, thank you. Uh, another speaker is Councillor Richard Williams. And I think I saw Councillor Deborah Roberts in fact, Councillor, I can't, we, we, this is, uh, we, I think we need to go to the vote, and so I'll, say, I'll finish with Councillor Wallace if you want. First of all, Councillor Richard Williams then. Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with what Councillor Peter Payne said, um, so I will, I will keep things short by, by, by just saying that. One, one question I will ask officers, are we following policy H16, development of residential gardens? Um, why was that deemed not relevant to this? Because this is a residential garden. I'd have to defer to the case officer on that. Would you like to repeat? Because I think it's not quite, just to hear your sound. Hopefully, yeah. for everybody. Can Sorry, policy H16, development of residential gardens. Um, it then goes on to list a whole lot of factors that we know um, that, that can be taken into account um, in, in, a, in, a, in a proposal to um, develop in a residential garden. All of those points are actually points that were made um, by Councillor Peter Bay, and everything he said fits within those factors um, in, in that policy. And, and that policy is not referenced at all in, in, in the officer's report. So, I, I'm just so the question is, you know, the policy around residential gardens and... Why was that deemed not relevant? It yes. seems very relevant to me. It's a question as well as a statement there, yeah, it's, a, it's a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah yes. can, have, can we um, separate both. out the question there from okay. the debate here? So, um, so the main question is why was H16 not used in the officer's report? Post confirmed, sorry? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So I'm having some sound issues today. Um, so H16 mainly refers to a residential amenity, character of the local area, siting, design, materials, uh, vehicle access, they're more the considerations that will be at a reserve matters stage rather than an outline. Um, probably should have referred to it in my committee report that that will be the next stage of the application and um, to refer to policy uh, principal development, so S7 and S9, about the new development being within a development framework and then policy H16 would be the next stage of this application process. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm going to be voting for the application because I can't actually see um, that we've got any real strong case not to. It's an outline application. Um, the facts are, that we're concerned about, um, and I agree with Councillor Heather Williams, it is, it is going to be tight. Uh, but the facts uh, are they will show at the next part of the exercise and if they can't be proven to be done, then it won't get approval. But I don't think we can refuse an outline application on this because the details will be um, there for us to consider later down the road. And if it becomes a, a case of, um, you know, the concerns, and I honestly don't think the, the case of the, the um, safety of the children actually amounts to anything that we can substantiate. The highways have said it's okay, um, you know, and they're the experts on, on that. And after all, you know, parents could put their cars a little bit further down the road and walk the children rather than have any confrontation at the gates, so to speak. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and so I'm now going to go to the vote on this one, members. And so the vote will be around the recommendation that committee approve this application subject to the conditions which start on page 71. So, so, sorry, sorry, Chair, I, I hate to develop, to come back on this, but, but I'm still not convinced that, that page 16 isn't relevant. It says the development of land used or last used as a residential garden for a new development will only be permitted where the development is for a one-to-one -one replacement of a dwelling in the countryside under policy H14 or there would be no significant harm to the local area taking account of, and it then goes on to list eight factors. Um, now, I, I'm, not, I'm not at all sure why that's not relevant at, at, at this stage, because it, it does cover the principle of, of development of gardens, surely. Thanks, Chair, through you. Um, I have to say I'm inclined to agree with Councillor Williams that I think the policy can be relevant. 
question in my mind would be how you would judge some of those things in the circumstances where we don't have any of that detail uh, at this stage. So I think um, if you consider in principle any dwelling on this site would be harmful, then you may, you may be able to cite this policy in a reason at this stage. But if you think that those concerns might be mitigated through design and other factors that will come later at the reserve matters stage, then um, that's the alternative. I think that's very helpful. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I, I do and I would. Um, you would use it as a reason for... I would. <laughs> yes, good. yes, I do and I would. Good. So if we could just um, rehearse the reasons for refusal if there were to be a refusal. So I think the reason I've heard is concerns around uh, the impact on highway safety, both during construction and post-occupation, um, and uh, therefore the uh, principle of a dwelling in this location being unacceptable for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, the precise wording perhaps to be agreed with Chair and Vice Chair um, following the, that debate. Good. So members, that, um, that balance, so we now go to the vote. Um, which is 13 to 4 against abstain to approve this application subject to the conditions which follow from page 71. Let's try the system. So we try the system, we press the blue figure and then say whether you are for, against or abstaining. And so um, there are seven votes in, in favor, three against, and one abstention. And with that, members, then this application of outline application is approved. And we will look forward to seeing what comes forward at the next for reserve matters. Thank you very much. We now go to agenda item seven, which is on pages 75 to 84 in our report pack. This is for application number 21 slash 00512 slash FUL, which is a full application in the parish of Bassingbourne, Cum Neesworth. And the proposal is for the change of use to a village hall, including social activities and as a base for the parish council. Ancillary uses include as a county library, community library and for health, education and indoor exercise. And this is at the Limes Community Centre in the High Street of Bassingbourne, Cum Neesworth. The applicant is Mrs. Valerie Tukey from Bassingbourne Parish Council. Um, the recommendations from the officers is approval. The key material considerations for us members, principle of development, highway safety and parking provision, and residential amenity. Um, there has been no site visit given the extraordinary circumstances we're living through in the pandemic. It's not a departure from policy. The application is brought before us because this is a minor development relating to land owned by South Cambridgeshire District Council and always, um, if there's been any representation objecting to that proposal, it must come before us as um, to ensure transparency and any conflict of interest. The presenting officer is Richard Fitzgerald. Richard, are you with us? Yes, Chair, hello. Hello. Do you have any okay. updates um, and, and then a summary of the application, please? Yeah, no, no, no updates, Chair. Hello. Okay. I'll just share my screen. Can I just confirm that you can see my screen, Chair? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so agenda item seven seeks planning permission for a change of use of the Lions Community, community Centre in Bassingbourne from Neesworth to a village hall, including social activities and as a base for the parish council. Ancillary uses include as a community library and for health, education, and indoor exercise. Um, the application site is shown outlined in red on the location plan on the screen. The application is before planning committee as the application is a minor development relating to land owned by South Cambridgeshire District Council and a representation has been received against the proposal. The representation is an objection from the local highway authority. Uh, this aerial image shows the location of the application site and the surrounding area. The site is located central uh, in a central position within the village of Bassingbourne 
and it's within the Basin Bourne conservation area. The site is predominantly surrounded by residential developments um, with the Lime Shelter Housing Estate um, located to the north. The southern boundary of the application site adjoins the High Street and the site can also be accessed from the limes um, to the north. These images show the Limes Community Centre. The proposal is solely for a change of use, so it doesn't include any external alterations to the building. The application site does not include any existing parking provision and the application does not propose to create any new uh, parking provision. The established planning use of the Limes Community Centre is communal facilities in association with the Limes Sheltered Housing Estate. However, it's understood from a large number of representations received from the local county councillor, ward councillor, parish council and local residents that the building has been used for a number of years as a community library and for regular meetings and events, including parish council meetings. Uh, the applicant has provided a list um, containing some of the current users of the Lyons Community, community Centre, which includes sheltered housing residents, Bassingbourne Kinesworth Parish Council, Bassingbourne Community Library, Environmental Group, Village Bands, CAMTAD Hearing Session, National Childbirth Trust, Over 60s Group, the Lego Group, Disaster Emergency Response Centre and as a polling station. The applicant has also provided a list of prospective additional future uses which they intend would take place within the building. Um, some of these include first aid training sessions, district and county councillor surgeries, MP surgeries, neighbourhood police surgeries, citizens advice bureau, film club, produce market, art displays, children's parties, men's shed, craft groups, private hire and parish council office and after funerals use. <clears throat> This map shows the majority of the village is located within one kilometre radius as the crow flies around the application site. The majority of the village is also within one kilometre radius of the site when measured along the public highway routes. These images show the nearby off-site parking locations which were the subject of the applicant's parking survey. It is important that members are aware that the applicant does not own uh, or does not have control over the availability of parking in these locations as they arrive within the highway or within land owned by other parties. However, the images do represent where the availability for on-street parking near to the site was during the period of the applicant's parking survey. And uh, the, um, it's also um, worth noting there's a um, bus stop located 50 metres away from the application site. Uh, the key considerations relevant to the proposal relate to the principle of developments, highway impacts and parking provision and residential amenity impacts. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Do we, um, we'll move directly. Thank you, Richard. If there are any questions, we'll come to you in the, in the debate if they come up. But we do we have representation from the parish council from councillor mike hallett yes good morning chair um, and thank you um, i'm mike hallett i'm the vice chair of battingham companies with parish council and i don't intend to spend too long uh, just going back over that again uh, there is very strong support in the village for the use of limes as a community hall and that's been evident from the number of representations that have been made uh, and particularly from County Councillor Susan van der Ven, who is strongly supportive. Uh, that said, there are two specific aspects I'd like to mention. One is uh, the impact on the local community is fairly limited because of the size of the hall. Uh, at the moment, there are only 36 chairs in there. Uh, difficult to fit too many more. Uh, we have had more people on occasion, but basically they have to stand at the back. Uh, you know, we, we've had 50 odd people in there, but it, it's tight. Uh, so the uh, proposed activities, which Mr. Fitzjohn has listed, uh, they are um, the sort of scale of activities 
So we're not expecting to have a, a huge additional impact on the community. The more effective use of the hall really comes by um, using the time that it currently sits empty. So a more effective use of the time. Uh, the other aspect is parking. Uh, now, because the building dates from 1877, it was obviously built with limited parking facilities. The four parking spaces in the back, which belong to the district council, we have been given permission to use. Uh, and we've also looked at the possibility of taking the wall down at the front to use the, the court card for parking. However, uh, that doesn't provide any additional gain because what you lose by parking in the courtyard, uh, you, sorry, what you gain from that, you lose by loss of parking on the frontage. So that's a, that's a question of gain three and lose three and there's no net benefit there. Uh, the parking survey which we did, all of the locations we looked at, except one which was just over, they were all within 200 metres. So they're all within a short parking distance of the hall and very accessible. And we concluded that there was enough space available for the sort of activities we're planning. So we would be very grateful for the benefit of the village to see this application approved. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions? Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, two questions. The first one is, um, oh, this is clear. <laughs> uh, when you said the, the issue is effective use of the time for the hall, what did you mean, Mr. Harrell? If you can expand on that. And uh, Yes, certainly on that question, uh, the hall sits at the moment empty for quite a long time. Uh, the number of activities that take place in there may be only, and I'm guessing now, but maybe 10 or 20% of the time is effectively utilised. Uh, now, it's obviously, it's a building there that doesn't want to sit empty. It wants to be sit and be used for community use. So we can, we can basically fill the calendar. Okay, thank you. And the second question, if I may, Chair, um, is to do with the, um, the survey that you did for the Highways Authority because they don't seem to be satisfied. What exactly is the problem? And uh, can you resolve it? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is difficult to, uh, to know the detail. My, um, they obviously, I think, were concerned whether there was sufficient parking for hall users as well as there being sufficient parking for residents. Um, but when we did the survey, we specifically looked at areas which didn't inconvenience the residents. In other words, we were looking for areas that uh, weren't immediately outside their houses. Uh, so we looked at, for example, the frontage of the lines itself. Uh, we looked at uh, surgery parking space which is available um, out of surgery hours. Uh, we looked at uh, areas along highways which weren't in front of, of people's properties. So we, we tried to fit it so that there was sufficient parking for the residents and for uh, users of the Lions Hall. Thank you very much, Mr. Held. I will ask, I think I'll direct that question because that's kind of a hard one for you to answer about why highways perhaps is um, <laughs> what, what, what their problems are. So we'll ask the, the people in the know in terms of planning. And we are in that, a very strange situation where, you know, usually it's everybody saying to highways, why aren't you objecting to this? And like everybody is saying that. And here we've got everybody saying, you know, it works, but highways are objecting. So if you could help <laughs> us understand that a little bit. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, my understanding is that the Highway Authority's concern is one of methodology more so than, uh, than the actual issue of, of parking itself. So you'll note um, in the third bullet point of paragraph 32, uh, reference to the Lambeth methodology for parking surveys. Uh, that is the County Council's preferred methodology. They don't look to endorse other methodologies. 
that isn't the methodology that had been used here. Uh, and so they retain an objection, my understanding is, for, for that reason. Uh, clearly, the concern and the judgment members have to make is the, the likely impact of parking associated with this use on the amenity of, of nearby residents as well as highway safety. Um, and um, that's a judgment for members to make. Uh, but that's my understanding of the Highway Authority's concern. It's one of methodology more so than anything else. So if, if we're to understand that clearly, that as that methodology was not used, they have therefore not given a, um, an evaluation of the impact of this. Uh, because that methodology wasn't used, the County Council is not satisfied with the evidence that was provided. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? One from Councillor Milnes, Chair. And uh, thank, thank you, Chair. So I just wanted to pursue that um, point uh, just briefly and ask, so that from a practical perspective, when your um, hall is currently full with its 30 or 40 people, what impact does that have on the parking in the vicinity? Um, we haven't seen uh, problems with parking with existing use. Uh, people who have visited the hall have always managed to find sufficient space to park. Um, bear in mind also that many of the hall users are very local uh, and they walk. Um, so, uh, you know, up, up till now we haven't experienced problems either for hall users or for residents. Thank you. And, and members, can we do, sort of, I'm just keeping focus as well. So what's being put before us is change of use, regularizing, I think, use, change of use, rather than any additional capacity um, that's being proposed, any change of capacity. Councillor Khan. I just wondered if uh, you considered us recommending uh, a time-limited uh, uh, permission to, to, to see whether there is a problem. Uh, which then could be renewed uh, if there was no problem at the end. I suspect that's a question for the officer, is it? Maybe we'll come back to that one in the debate then. Thank you. We'll put it to the officer. Anybody else? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. And we do have um, local members. And we have Councillor Nigel Cathcott. Would you like to speak now or? I'll have a word. Nice. <laughs> yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I've come to fully support this application. Um, Bussingbourne has never actually had a designated village hall. It's a thriving village, it's a growing village, it's a vital village. It's got other facilities, but a village hall is one that's always lacked. And this need was identified strongly in a uh, village survey done a number of years ago. Um, the, uh, 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 and this is the ideal, the best, and frankly almost the only opportunity the village will have to secure a village hall in what must be, in many ways, an ideal position, right in the center of the village. It's equidistant from the major residential areas, and I think this was indicated, um, uh, uh, one kilo, most of the residential areas are one kilometre away. Um, a lot of other villages had to build village halls distant from that. But this is highly accessible to people in the village. It was also the old school, school village hall that's had a strong history of community use over very, very many years. Uh, and that history and recollection is still there, very much alive in the minds uh, of the people within the village. So this strong community use is a big advantage for this hall. Um, uh, it's used at the moment as a, as, a, as a sheltered facility for the people in the line, in, at the back. Now that will continue, um, not all the time, nor do they want it all the time. Uh, so we will continue to actually, or the parish intends to continue offering it as a facility. Um, in addition to that, uh, the, the village library is housed there. If this did not go ahead, we'd lose the library. There's nowhere else in the village for it. And it had to move from the village college number, a number of years ago or was able to uh, accommodate it. Uh, and there are plans. Uh, at the moment, it's a book cafe, and the books all get mixed up. We've got a kiosk in the room. Uh, and the plans are to actually turn the, uh, what the, um, 
from the main reply consent to the kitchen area in, into a, a self-contained room on a library facility so they can use it again as a library in, in the village. And that's, that's quite important. Um, uh, the other thing is that other meetings take place there as well, other, 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 um, uh, other, 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 other village groups. And I didn't know there were so many village groups until we actually started this process. Uh, because there's a considerable enthusiasm within the, the parish for this to go ahead and for people to actually make it work, make it a success. Uh, and there's a long-term commitment from a variety of other uh, people within the village. This will be essentially for the village. It won't be for other, 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 uh, other purposes. So people um, uh, are able to access it very conveniently. This is something I don't think the county have fully taken on board. Um, at the moment, the majority of people actually walk to the, to the facility. They can get there on foot because of the close proximity of residential areas. Um, and, uh, and certainly from time to time, quite large events take place. I remember a number of months ago, well, actually last year now, there was a meeting, a huge meeting, to accommodate the pavilion uh, which, uh, reconstruction. I think 120, 130 people turned up. Um, but was there a parking problem? No. And the reason for that was that people know and understand the village. So they walked there. The vast majority walked or a number of people cycled. Thank so, you. Um, okay. That's okay. Thank you. That's three minutes. That okay, right. I, I just wanted to... Yeah, okay. Um, you can come in the debate. I'll well. come in the debate. Sorry, yeah. So thank you. Um, but, it, uh, yeah, okay. but I just very briefly, but I just mentioned that because it's been used essentially as a village hall anyway for a variety of purposes, this has never exhibited a parking problem, and that's an important point to understand, because what we're asking for, I think, is just a continuation, broadly, of what happens at Milton. Thank you very much. Um, and do we have Councillor Susan van der Ven as the county councillor with us? Oh, sorry. Chair. Sorry, oh, Councillor Cathcart. I'm very sorry. Do you have any questions? Uh, three, Chair, from Councillors Heather Williams, Khan, and Rippard. Thanks, Chairman. I was, I was concerned Councillor Cathcart wouldn't have his, his um, moment for a minute. Um, it seems very strange sort of going this way to this way. Um, I, I was just wondering, because obviously parking is probably the, the, the key um, issue here, whether you'd be in agreement with, with myself that by its nature, where it is, that the actual residential properties surround, such as the lines up Nutford Road and Spring Lane, the majority of the... Um, those dwellings don't um, encourage really car ownership or a very few people along there have car ownership. So that, I think if it was a different part of the village, would you agree that it'd be more of a concern with parking because you might have residential parking on the road on top? With the exception of the highway, would, would, um, High Street, would you agree that the, the nature of the dwellings nearby mean that parking is less of, a, less of an issue? very carefully when doing the parking survey uh, that we set up a number of parameters. One, uh, is it outside houses? Two, is it anywhere hazardous? Is it on a fend in the road? Is it obscured in some way? And is it close to the buildings? So we've got four or five tests we imposed when looking at that parking provision. And that is one of them. You're quite right. The fact that we did identify a number of areas where um, there is less residence parking in the high street than elsewhere. So that does soften the problem considerably. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Khan. <coughs> How long has the uh, building been used for community uses um, in addition to the, that, that which was been commissioned for in 1995? Community? Um, well, it's been used for some time. Um, Martin? Probably um, the library's been there, what, for 20 years, I should think? And the other uses, I think, have evolved over time um, uh, and um, over the last 15, 20 years, I expect. So there's been a variety and a spectrum of uses that it's actually... Um, so why have you not gone for, uh, gone for planning permission rather than for uh, established use? <laughs> um, that's a good question. That's really something for the officers. Uh, we did a we did a uh, a pre a pre a, um, uh, a 
pre-application inquiry, and we were advised at that stage that to be on the safe side, we needed planning permission. Um, yes, I agree, an established use or a lawful use certificate uh, could well have been an avenue to explore, but I think we just wanted to be secure to make sure we, we had it all in place. Just so, whilst you're on, the, the question of a temporary use, the problem about that is it, the parish want to get on with things. They want the security of knowing that they have permission and knowing that they um, can actually do what is necessary in order to actually make this work for the village. The problem about a temporary consent is that the whole thing is sort of in limbo. You can't do any work, you can't spend any money. So I think the feeling in the village would prefer to have permanent permission rather than temporary uh, uh, permission. Um, but Thank you. To Thank you, Patrick. Councillor Ripley. Um, actually, it's the Lord today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Cathcart. Thank you. Um, do we have Councillor Vanderven with us? Chair, I, I understand that Councillor Vanderven is still having computer problems, so I believe Chris Carter has a, a backup statement. He, he's very calmly reassuring us that he does. Thank you, James. I do. Uh, so I'll read that out now, if that's okay. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to offer my unequivocal support for this planning application. The prospect of a proper village hall is one of the most important opportunities to come to Bassingbourne in recent years. The old school is a natural site, and indeed the range and depth of commun community activities already based there offers a platform of evidence to demonstrate that this site works very well. As County Councillor for Bassingbourne, I've taken advantage of the old school for regular drop-in advice surgeries where I often coincide with regular after-school library users, also as a meeting point for the Cam Vale bus user group, always well attended, with no demand for car parking due to its central location, accessible by all forms of active travel, including a bus stop just outside. I have also attended all manner of events uh, and meetings there, organized by the parish council and various village community groups. All in all, the current, current proposal builds on rich community experience, the emphasis on walking, cycling, and active and sustainable travel for accessing the proposed village hall complements aspirations locally and countywide to reduce our carbon footprint and make active, sorry, and make active and sustainable travel our primary means of getting around. Indeed, modal shift and encouragement of sustainable travel is one of the core tenets in the new county council's joint agreement, which is encouraging to see project, projects like this underway. I do hope the planning committee will be able to support this application. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, members, we're going to debate now. Councillor Heather Williams is first. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I ought to add that um, I am aware of how long this has been going on and the various attempts that have been made for a village hall. Because I, I lived in the village from 97 to, to 2012, I think. Um, so, so grew up there, and I've. I've seen how hard the village has worked, even and looked at every option, even taking out the pew from the church at one point with nets and, and everything. So I, I think, um, I think the, we have to look at the purpose of this village hall and and what support it has, and the fact that this is really for local local residents. This isn't putting a, a new you know, facility in. It's not putting something like when there was the sports sports centre put in, for example, which. Quite understandably, that needed um, appropriate parking with it. This is for, to a certain extent, just reassure and give the, the existing use has been there, problematic free. Um, and I think think time has come for Bassingbourne to have a village hall, given its size. Um, and uh, not to say that Littlington won't be won't be uh, obviously rivaling it, but its size means and the surrounding area. I really don't see parking being. Uh, the issue that um, is is feared in the objection, but I don't even think it's feared in the objection. I think it is simply a, a procedural calculation from the looks of it. Um, and if you know the area well, you'll know that there's, there's plenty of area for those in, in the operating hours um, that it, it will be functioning. So um, I think it's it would be a shame to not support this 
um, both from planning down to community reasons. Thank you, Chairman. Can, if, can, what, I, what can I, mm -hmm. if, if nobody else objects, can I move to a vote? Yes. I was just about to say the same about because what I was thinking is, what we have to look at very seriously, obviously, is if we get an objection by highways, we have to take that seriously, because we're often asking why there isn't an objection for highways. And I think what we're seeing here is highways, is on, as I understand, on point of principle, is saying we need everybody, applicants, to use our methodology. And if we use the methodology, then we can give the proper evaluation. We can see that a lot of work has gone in by the, you know, by the community to provide evidence, and this is a regularization of use. So this is you know, going against that um, procedure, but there just seems to be so much common sense and support from everybody, everybody that we've heard from. That, yes, um, have I said something wrong, Matthew? <laughs> yes, would you like to? Because I was about to go to the vote, but yes. Uh, before um, we move to the vote, although Councillor Milne has asked to, to vote, he did leave the meeting for a minute, so I'm afraid you're precluded from voting. And I didn't even spot that. But the chair said the same thing. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So, can I um, move? Because there are no reasons for refusals have been given on this one, and um, the recommendation is that planning permission be granted subject to appropriate planning conditions and the conditions are there on page 83 and I think we can take this by affirmation any objections abstentions and a no vote thank you very much Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for all the work to support that. Well done, everybody. Um, it's now 1.20. We said, so members, I'd like to say, we said we would have a short break for lunch if we got to this time. We have got agenda item eight, which is in Histon, and then we have a proposed diversion of a footpath followed by enforcement report, and we don't have appeals because we just had a meeting two weeks ago for that one. Um, Councillor Ripley. Can we press on? That's what you would like. Yeah. How does <laughs> that, everyone That's feel? my preference. There's a, there's a proposal that we press on rather than having a half hour break. Anybody? Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair. Sure. I don't mind that, but it might be wise to have it at least a five minute jump and break for members. Um, I was thinking the same, yeah. Shall we say 10 minutes? So it does mean you can actually take a breath of air and if there's a queue at the toilet, then we're abiding by social distancing rules. So if you say 10 minutes, um, that would be 1.30. Aaron, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody.
Welcome back, everybody. We just had a short break to make sure we've got a bit of fresh air. Um, seeing as we're in a room with, with no ventilation here, and it's a rather warm day as well, so we're very busy as well, guys. Um, grab a bit of sugar as well, so thank you very much. Uh, so, welcome back, everybody. This is South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. We're now on agenda item eight, which is on page 85 of your um, agenda pack. This is for application number 20 slash 05404 slash HFUL, full um, application. This is for 24 Manor Park in Histon. The proposal is for a single story rear extension and park conversion of redundant garage to form utility room. The applicants are Mr. and Mrs. Matthews. Key material considerations are the character and appearance of the area, residential amenity and highway matters. It's not a departure from policy and the application is being brought before us members because the applicant is a contractor working for South Cam's District Council. So we've had a few of those today. So they're coming before us, getting a bigger grilling than most would because they're coming before full planning committee, but to ensure transparency and um, making sure there's no conflict of interest in final decisions. And the presenting officer, Charlotte Spencer. Charlotte, are you with us? Uh, yeah, I'm with it. Who's here? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, can you all see that? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so this is an application for 24 Manor Park in Histon. Um, as you just explained, it's for a single storey rear extension and park conversion of redundant garage to form utility room. Uh, so the application relates to a two storey semi detached dwelling house located to the west of Manor Park, just here. The site lies within the development framework and there were no other relevant constraints on the site. Um, it is attached to number 22. Manor Park to the north and number 26 um, shares a side boundary with number 26 Manor Park to the south and um, to the way rear lies a small wooded area. Um, this is the existing situation at the property um, so they have a conservatory at the moment which would be demolished and the garage is located there to the rear and that's the one that will be converted. Um, so these are the proposed drawings. Uh, the extension would have a depth of 4.1 metres. Um, as you can see, it will span the full width of the dwelling house. Be characterised by a dual pitched roof with a maximum height of 3.75 metres. And the southern corner here would adjoin the existing garage, which would be converted to a utility and store. The alterations to the garage include the removal of the up and over garage door with a standard door and the addition of a window on the side. Uh, so this is the property here um, when viewed from the street and this is the aerial photograph. This one here is the is number 24 you can see number 22 and 26 either side and the applicant has submitted kind of indicative drawings of what the extension would look like. Uh, they have also submitted um, shadow drawings showing the impact of sunlight on any neighbouring properties. Uh, the material considerations are the impact of the character and appearance of the area, the impact on neighbouring amenities and the impact on parking. Uh, is, sorry, let's close that down. Um, Thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, Thank you. And there are no um, representations from, from neighbours, as we understand from the report. I'm sure there's no update on that. Um, and the Parish Council has recommended refusal, but there is no Parish Council representation. Nobody's asked to speak today. Um, local member, Councillor Martin Calm, would you like to speak now or during the debate? During the debate. Yep. Um, I'm also a local member, and I would 
if, if necessary during the debate. <laughs> Good. Members, is there anything that you would like us to consider on this one? You can see Parish Council's reasons for objecting. Yes, Councillor Milnes, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a, a quickie. Could the officer just bring back the visualisation uh, for us, please? Yep. We, we skipped through that slide quite quickly before I had a chance to uh, yep. see. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just bring that back up. This one? Yes, because the next one is the, the, the lighting cabin. The one before that? Sorry, it's all, in, it's all in the rear, isn't it? Other than the garage to the front. Yes. Yep. Could you correct. just go to the next slide for me again and do it full screen? If you do an MF5. Thank you. Do you have a question? Or you just wanted to see no, that's it. fine. Thank you. I just wanted to get a, a, a better impression seeing as they've bothered doing the... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, members, any, any comments? I mean, what, what, for me as a local member, uh, what I would say is the Parish Council is concerned about impact on amenity. On page 88, we have the officer's report where it's measuring, um, you know, the distances and says there is some, so not on and not on impact on number 26. On number 22, what they're saying is that they would have a marginal increased impact on sunlight, but not one that would be seen to, you know, to need merit refusal. Um, and that the, the ground floor side window would not result in a loss of, of privacy. And so in the case officer's report, I don't see grounds for refusal myself in terms of local member, and none of the neighboring properties that would, would feel, you know, actually be impacted have made any representations. Mm. With, with, with your mic on. The property on the left hand side, Madam Chairman, can I just ask, it appears to be, is that a glass roof of a conservatory? So the middle picture at the top and that one, yeah, what, what's that? Yeah, it's a conservatory, That's and conservatory. there was another two-story, um, small two-story rear extension. Can I, I'm just thinking that I'm a little surprised then that they haven't made some representation because we're going to have quite a change. Um, are we absolutely assured that they have been carded? Well, it's just confirmation that the consultation has gone out and that those, those dwellings, neighbouring, have received um, in Information. Yes, it, it was received. A site notice was also um, installed outside the property. Good. Members, should we go to a vote? Yes. Good. Thank Can you very much. Can we do it by affirmation, please, Chair? Yes. So the, um, there were no reasons for refusal being cited, and so therefore the recommendation is that the Planning Committee grant Planning Commission subject to appropriate planning conditions, and those are on page 89. Can we take that by affirmation? Agreed. No refusals, no abstention. Thank you very much. We go to agenda item nine, which is the proposed diversion of part of Melbourne public footpath number six and stopping up of Melbourne public footpath number eight, which is on page 91 um, of our agenda pack. We've had a couple of these, haven't we? Sort of the diversions of these footpaths. And Who's presenting this one? The presenting officer from the County Council, Chair, but just for your information why they're coming to committee, the um, scheme of delegation doesn't currently allow officers uh, to deal with these matters, so they have to come to committee uh, by default. So that's why it's here. Thank you. So uh, coming by default, so this um, is, I think, James Stringer, who's the African Information Definitive Map Officer at County Council. Yes? 
And are you with us, James? I am, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, lovely. I can't, um, I don't have the permission to share, but um, not that I have particularly anything to share. It's, it, it should be all in the pack. But um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, this is, this is a, 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 an application to divert a small section of Melbourne public footpath and um, stopping up a, another section to allow for the um, delivery of an approved astro turf pitch at Melbourne Village College. Um, the application has been made under the Town and Country Planning Act under Section 257, as, as Chris just mentioned, that they come to committee by default due to them not being in the, the, the current scheme of delegation. So um, the, the, as, as the other one that came a couple of months ago for, for Camborne, that fairly straightforward insofar as um, the, the planning permission has been granted um, and the diversion of the public rights of way are required to enable that um, approved development to be delivered. Um, it's currently across the school playing area and it's of a, a very natural grass surface. The new route will be of a similar grass surface and the County Council has confirmed as Highway Authority that it is content with that proposal. There will be some additional um, way marking signage to ensure people um, stick to the path as much as possible and, and don't stray into too much into the school grounds. Um, but the, the recommendation um, is that an order that South Cambridgeshire District Council make an order to um, uh, divert these public footpaths. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Could we move by affirmation um, to approve this diversion of the public footpath? And thank you very much for the representation. Affirmation. Thank you very much. Um, no refusals, no abstentions. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. Members, um, we come to agenda item 10, which is the enforcement report on page 127 of the agenda pack. And presenting this. We should have Will with us, I hope. Yes. Hello. Can you see me, chat? Will, who has the will to live, waiting until the end of our meetings. <laughs> Trying to spread some joy at the end of your meeting. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yep. Thank you, Will. Yes. Do you want to provide any updates or any particular detail on the enforcement report? Yes, Jack. I only have one verbal update to do with the crowd A site and um, Paul Heath Lane in, Hint in Linton. Uh, negotiations for a scheme to discharge the outstanding conditions for foul and water drainage are still ongoing. Um, hopefully, we're reaching a conclusion, but from an enforcement perspective, uh, there's no breach um, at the moment on site. Um, that's it for the verbal update. Uh, on a further note, if there are any cases that members would like me to, to share at the next planning committee, please contact me. Um, and let me know, and I can have them straight on. Um, and also, I'm looking to improve how much information that we share as a planning enforcement section. So if there are any things that you would like me to share, please come straight to me as well. That's really welcome news, and I think it'd be really good for people to let you know ahead of the meeting, um, and then you can make sure that information is in the meeting. That would be very, very helpful, Will. And I think we do have a question, Councillor Hello Williams. Thank you. Um, thank you all. At the last meeting, I did ask for an um, issue to be added on in Arrington to do with the Whitehall Farms. You may have contacted me. What you wouldn't know is my emails are, I, I don't know the technical term, so up the swanny at the moment, which basically means that um, if you've emailed me, apologies, I've not emailed you back because I can't. So if you are able to give me a call, that would be very much appreciated because I haven't got a phone number on here for you. Thank you. Yes, sir, uh, Councillor, I did send you an email on the 28th <laughs> at the end of last committee, uh, but I, I will get give it you... next week. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Will, and thank you for following up so quickly. Councillor Roberts. Thank Chairman, thank you. Just a, a, a quick thought. Obviously, it's not in my manner, um, but the Burwash Manor Farm um, situation does seem to be going on quite a considerable amount of time. And I remember when we first 
um, look to uh, refusing it after it had been put up without permission. Um, one of the uh, points that was very, very much made was uh, the effect, the bad effect it was having on neighbours' um, lives because the amount of noise, etc. And I'm thinking, um, this, it seems to be there's still um, activity going on there. You know, we're into yet another hot summer where people want to have a little bit of um, quiet and calm, especially at weekends. So, um, you know, I see it saying preparing a prosecution file. How soon will that be likely to be actually happening, please? Yeah, so the prosecution is being prepared by John Shuttlewood, who is the principal over at Cambridge City. Um, he's had long-standing matters with this case. It's in process, unfortunately. I can't get a specific deadline um, for it to be done by. However, what I can state is that we will continue to monitor the site. If the harm does continue and gets to a level, we do have other enforcement options to consider, such as potentially um, a stop notice. Um, but I will update you as soon as possible, uh, Councillor. Thank you very much for that. Um, I recently contacted about a problem with the, the Impin, a new development on Impington Lane uh, due to flooding in the rear gardens of houses adjoining uh, because the uh, development had prevented the uh, pre-existing drainage uh, going across the field. It was difficult to enforce because there were conditions for sustainable drainage dealt with the site itself rather than the impact on adjoining uh, 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 properties. Have you considered how we might take account of preventing this sort of problem in future, in future planning conditions for future, future applications. Yes, yeah, so I think, Councillor, when, when issues like these arise, it does help us steer towards policy. Um, I mean, from our personal point of view on this case, I have contacted the drainage officer uh, and I'm waiting for a response. Um, and then I'm hoping to go to the developer to see if there is anything that we can do um, to mitigate the flooding. Um, but yes, it is something to note moving forward. Councillor Payne. Chair, um, yes, as Councillor Roberts mentioned, the Burwood Canal Farm case has been coming back to us over and over again. Um, I think I'm just concerned that an appeal was allowed against our planning refusal. Our original enforcement notice was quashed, so the reaction is to draft a fresh enforcement notice. That was the 9th of July 2020. Uh, there's a statement here that harm is being caused by people sitting in the area. Um, I'm not quite sure whether we really need to be proceeding with this and whether this can make things of ourselves by carrying on when the appeal has been allowed. I think that's a, a do you want a response on that? I think you're, you're following procedure at the moment, Will, aren't you? Yeah, yes, there's a technical breach of uh, planning enforcement notice. Uh, the next step is to prosecute. Thank you very much. I think you can't stand with about proportionality, but I think you're in the middle of a whole haven't you, procedural process. Thank you very much. Um, and I think if there have been no appeals, we've come to the next planning committee meetings. We just had a report on those in the last committee meeting, which was just two weeks ago. Um, members, that's the end of the meeting. Thank you very much. At 1.50... Thank you very much, everybody.